Is this thing on? Are you ready, Matt? You're listening to Box Office Binges with Matt Diaz and Ernesto Santos. Good evening, folks. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Box Office Binges. Hello, welcome to another episode of Box Office Bingers. We're trying something new here. We're using a video element. And I, (laughs) yes, you can see us now. And I am very excited for this episode to be the episode that we are trying something new. And Ernesto, you've been working really hard on this, so I thank you very much to try to make this all possible. But we are diving in to our 2023 Oscars prediction episode. Ernesto, we've been talking about this particular episode and the Oscars for quite some time now. Yeah. So how excited are you that we're finally here having this episode? I'm just glad we're finally making it happen. I do want to clarify. So we're through Anchor and Spotify. You can, If you have Anchor or Spotify, the video will be available um, I don't believe Apple has that capability. Uh, yeah, you'd have to so. check. You'd have to check with your local streaming, whatever you use to stream with. But we know that through Spotify and Anchor, the, vis, the if you're using the video element, then you should be able to see us. Um, but also, it it'll go. It should go back and forth. So you should be able to listen to us, or you can hear us. So whether you're listening to us or hearing us, we're just glad you're here. Welcome to our 2023 Oscar predictions. We have. I feel like this is the year. Like. I feel like I feel like creep, you know, like we've been we've been knocking we've just been knocking shit out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and and it's great because I like you said you mentioned this many times before that this is I feel like the first year that we've really knocked a lot of these out the nom- like uh, we watched a lot that that's been offered for the nominations. Yeah. And so we are well prepared to have this discussion that I'm very excited for us to have. And uh and yeah, so let's dive right into it. And, and before we and before we do that, um, as as you also know, we've also had many other nom, uh, award shows that we've been talking about throughout this episode. So be, or throughout this this podcast, uh, multiple episodes, previous episodes. But before we dive into our 2023 Oscars predictions, I just want to kind of want to go over the lay of the land here um, and showcase some of the other winners to kind of just see how we are leading to this point. Uh, pretty much, if you look at the other award show, it kind of gives you like a little bit of a preview of like what's being liked, what's being awarded, where the trajectory when this goes. I mean, honestly, Ernesto, if you remember, it kind of paints a clear path for some from some nominees that if they keep winning every category and all these other awards, there's odds are it's going to win the big one at the Oscars. Yeah. So that's why I kind of like to look at this and see where other people are kind of where other awards are giving their awards to. Um, in previous episodes, we've already discussed the winners of the Golden Globes and the Critics' Choice Awards. At the time of this recording, the Screen Actors Guild Awards and the Writers Guild Awards have not been the winners have not been announced yet. So unfortunately, we do not know that. So we're not going to put that in. Uh, in our conversation, because we don't know the winners yet. Um, but probably by the time you are listening to this episode, I believe the Screen Actors Guild Awards would have already been, uh, the winners would have already been announced. But at the time of this recording, we don't have that. Um, but for now, let's go over some of the highlights from the rest of them. I kind of want to, as a reminder, kind of go over the Golden Globes uh, Golden Globes winners and some of the highlights there. In the drama categories, we have Best Picture went to The Fablemans, Best Actor went to Austin Butler and Elvis, Best Actress went to Kate Blanchett in uh, tar in the comedy and musical categories best picture went to the banshees of inner sharon best actor went to colin farrell in the banshees of inner sharon and best actress went to michelle yo and everything everywhere all at once uh, best director went to steven spielberg for the fablemans best supporting actor went to key key kwan no key who kwan thank you yes key who kwan for everything everywhere all at once best supporting actress went to um uh, angela bassett for her performance in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, and Best Animated Feature went to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Um, Now going over the Critics' Choice Awards winners, the Best Picture went to Everything Everywhere All at Once. The director, Best Director went to the Daniels for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Best Actor went to Brendan Fraser for his performance in The Whale. Best Actress went to Kate Blanchett again for Tar. Um, Best Supporting Actor 
went to Ki Hu Kwan again, and Best Supporting Actress went to Angela Bassett again, and Best Animated Film went to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio again. Um, the Producers Guild, which at the time of this recording was just last night, um, outstanding producer for theatrical motion pictures went to Everything Everywhere All at Once. I'm glad to see that. Yeah. Outstanding producer for animated theatrical motion picture went to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. And outstanding producer of documentary motion pictures went to Navali, mm. uh, Navalny, which is one of the – sorry? Navalny. Navalny, sorry. Um, and that is one of the uh, document doc, documentaries that is nominated – at this year's Academy Awards. So we will be talking about that when we get to the documentary category. And lastly, um, the Directors Guild Awards, Outstanding Directorial Achievement for Apple Feature Film, Wendell Zeddy yet again for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Ernesto, I think it's safe to say that that was a well-deserved win for the Daniels. They're, they've been they've been sweeping. I mean, obviously well-deserved. I mean, we saw that movie, it must have been... March? When did it, come it came out, out of March of last March, year. But, and we reviewed it shortly thereafter yeah and that's still i mean that was one of my favorite movies from last yeah, absolutely. year absolutely and it was mine as well um it, it the daniels beat out todd field in for directing tar joseph krasinski for directing top gun maverick martin mcdonough for directing the banshees of inner sharing and steven spielberg for directing the fablemans so a lot of heavy hitters there uh and knocks that apart again well deserved uh for outstanding directorial achievement for first time feature film went to charlotte wells for her film After Sun, which the only nom- Oscar nomination it has is for Best Actor. I, I forgot his name, but he, we'll be talking about him later. And uh, for the only f- After Sun was the only the only nomination received was for Best Actor. Mm-hmm. And uh, Outstanding Directorial Achievement in Documentary and uh, do- in Documentary went to Sarah Dosa for Fire of Love, which might give it a little bit of an edge going into the Oscars as well. So there you go. That's the lay of the land right now. That is what we're dealing with right now. Like I said, we don't have the Screen Actors Guild and we don't have the Writers Guild winners. But I think for what we do have, it's enough to kind of paint. I think there's some of them, Ernesto, that you can kind of paint a clear picture on who might win the Oscars. Yeah. There's some, <laughs> the so- I think I, there's a few like small ones that actually not maybe – like one or two here and there that I haven't seen, but I've seen enough where I think I can make my decision. Yeah, and whether it should or will, we're about to have that discussion. But yeah, some of them, whether you like it or not, it seems to be painting a pretty clear picture on who's going to be winning yeah. that, that coveted award. But let's dive right into it, shall we, Ernesto? Let's dive in to kind of the moment we've we've been waiting for, the ones that we're really excited for. This, we're now diving into our 2023 Oscars predictions and we are going to dive right into the first category, which is animated short film. And the nominees are The Boy, The Mole, The Fox, and The Horse, The Flying Sailor, Ice Merchants, My Year of Dicks, and An Ostrich Told Me the World is Fake, and I Think I Believe It. Ernesto, your thoughts on, on these nominees and who you think should and will win. Hmm. Well... The boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse. That one was that one was kind of cute. You had Idris Elba as a fo- as like a fox, and it's all his mm. voice is always soothing. I did really really enjoy the animation on that one. I thought it was kind of mm-hmm. cool. Uh, Flying Sailor was strange. Uh, <laughs> Ice Merchants was I. It was I don't know. It was fine. Like. I, as I saw what they were doing, like halfway through, it was like a global warming thing. I was like, okay. And then I, I actually thought that they were going to die. Like, that's kind of where I thought yeah, they were going it, with it. I, I was did, like, wow, yeah. this is mm-hmm. this is really dark. And you know <laughs> what? If they had died, it probably would have made for, like, a more impactful ending as opposed to... I, I don't, I, I don't know if I agree with you on that. I, I think I really like the ending for Ice Merchants. It's a happy ending. I'm saying, but if it you, is, it if is you really ending. want to drive that global warming <laughs> thing in, like, you know, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, no, I get it. Like I get the, it. The yes. death would have been like, wow, like we got to fix this planet so those people don't die. <laughs> But right? then again, they were living on an, on an iceberg. I mean, well, I don't know. Like, they were living on a hill. They're Not a great way to live. That is I, their yeah. living. They sold yes. blocks of ice. <laughs> yes, but like, but they were also, didn't, you don't have to live up there. That's all I'm saying. That's, that's, I that's mean, I live, right in, I live in Central Florida, so I get you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I understand. <laughs> um, and then we got My Year of Dicks, which is as awkward as a name as it was. It was actually, like, I actually thought 
it was pretty good. Like the story was mm-hmm. pretty good. It was really interesting. But I think the winner for me is going to be the final one. And Ostrich told me the world is fake. I think I believe it. Um, I just thought it was so creative. I remember we were watching it and you're like, I don't know what this is, but I think you just have to zoom in. <laughs> and for those, if you've seen it, um, <laughs> what it is is that you're seeing them create this stop motion that the, the the movie is of the recording of the movie. It's very meta. Yes. It is. I mean, also the story is meta in and of itself. Correct. Like the, the creation of it is meta. And then the, the, the story is also meta. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with you. I also did enjoy it um, as well, but yeah, I was a little bit confused with it at first. And I was like, Oh no, that's not. Oh, now I get it. It's I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Just, just watch it. And I'll say you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get it. You get it. You know, you know, um, you know, yeah. Um, okay. So you're, so, so you think, so what's your should and will then? That's uh, that's it both. Mm, I really wanted to win. I thought I just thought it was so different. Like it's just something so like like we've seen. I've seen the the political cartoons, and I guess I'm just I guess I'm just kind of over them. Like that was like three mm. like two or three years ago. It just feels like they're rehashing the same shit over again. Like it didn't work the last two years. Like what are we doing? Like it's I don't know. Mm-hmm. And just to see something it, they're taking on a it's just a different take. Um, so that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. I, th- I, I think it should win and it, I hopefully will win. Okay. So you're, you're on both on that. I'm a lock in both. That's how I bought the lock in both. I'm locking okay. in both. Cause that's what I want. Cause that's what I want to happen. I'm going to speak it into existence, Fair enough. I, but I will take the L if I lose. So obviously. <laughs> okay. So what's, what's second place for you then? Uh, second place would actually be my year of dicks. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I kind of agree with you on the fact that the bull, the, the bull, not a bull, the, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse was a cute movie or a cute short film. Animation was great in it. Uh, a little bit different, it's like but it, almost. it yeah, storybook. Yeah. Um, it, I just doesn't, it, it didn't do anything for me mm. at the end of the day. Like the story, I didn't feel like was strong enough. Um, the flying sailor though, after watching the behind the scenes, I got a perspective on it, but it was nothing compared to the other three that I feel like are more in the conversation. Well, well so that, what was the behind the scenes on that one? The behind the scenes was there. It's the, the flying sailor is it. So the shorts based on a, a, um, a fable, I guess that was that, uh, based on a, a light, true story of a sailor who was just walking down the pier and two ships that were carrying dynamite exploded. And so the sailor was on the pier. It pushed him back and he ended up surviving that explosion, but he was fully naked. Like the, the explosion <laughs> ripped off all of his clothes. And then uh, so then he woke up and not a scratch on him, which a lot of people were surprised about. Like, oh, my God, you survived. You survived this horrific incident. Um, and so what the filmmakers decided to do was to take that idea and like, what was this sailor thinking when he was presumably flying in the air they wanted to simulate his eyes were flashing before his eyes so well that makes a hell of a lot more sense now if they had yeah. given us that context in the short film i would have ranked this one a lot higher because i kind of gathered that but i don't yeah. know i would have wanted that like i like you shouldn't have to watch a behind the scenes to get that deeper appreciation like something like that that should sure. be kind of known within the story itself i felt like yeah, I mean, like I said, I kind of got there too, but it was, it was too quick and it was too weird for me to really think about it. Other than the other three that I think were a lot better put together. Correct. Um, I, I, I kind of, I really enjoyed the I Archer than you did. Um, yeah. I kind of want to put it up as like my. For me, I'm putting it as a close second between. The ice merch, or I'm sorry, tied for a second between the ice merchants and an ostrich told me the the world is fake, and I think I believe it. That they're they're really close to me because my winner, and I think should and will, is my year of dicks. I think what they mm. what they were able to do with the story, and I think what has a leg up on it is the different animation styles that it has throughout it. They told really clear. I what was it with like five short stories in a matter of 25 minutes. And each you one bring up a good point. And like I got every one of them. I mean, I, I'm not. A, I, I was never a teenage girl, but I was able to relate to the story. 
story of what they might have been feeling as a, as a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. And it, these are these are personal diaries or like that for, with the filmmaker. Like these were her her own personal stories that she went through in her adolescent years. And I, I got all that. It was very clear to me. Um, and I was able to, you know, kind of, you know, feel for it, understand it. And 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 then the fact that each it was basically five minute shorts and 25 minute time span. You gave me you gave me five animated shorts like and and to for it to do that fairly well and to have somewhat of a happy ending at the end of the day. Um, that's why I give it the win, I think. And also, it, I think what really helps is that it was different animation styles within it. And I think that that adds to it as well. So you make a, um, you make a really I, good case. Yeah, which I don't disagree with you with the uh, an ostrich told me the world is fake and I believe it. I think it was very creative. I and and it does have the edge as far as like we, we always say that filmmakers like you know like to award other filmmakers for showing like kind of like behind the scenes stuff. You know the Oscars like movies about movies. Like this is peeling back the curtain on the stop motion process, which a lot of animated. Uh, um, animated, even the animated, the, the feature category, a lot of the stuff is stop motion it, that was nominated. So there's obviously an appreciation for it. I, it just, it did, and I think that's what it did for me. Like, not only are you getting, you're still getting the story, but you're also, mm -hmm. like, you're getting this time lapse of them doing it, and you're like, God, like, it's literally showing you the process of why yeah. it is so hard to do, because you have to go frame by frame, in, you know, spot by spot, and it's not... It's not an easy thing to do. So I, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it because it gave me that because it gave me that appreciation while also giving me an entertaining story at the same time. Right. But then on, to kind of go further, what you were saying, it's like it's not even that they decided to show you the behind the scenes. Of, it, it, it was incorporated in the story. Yes. There was a reason why you were seeing the behind the scenes of it as well. So with that, I can see it. I, like I said, it's a close second for me. But I feel like my year of dicks has a little bit more of an edge that I can see. That reason why I think it should, should and will win. Okay, Matt. Well, I guess we'll, we're gonna. We'll I see. guess we're gonna find out. <laughs> yes. Um, and also, just to kind of hone back on the uh, on this video because I'm looking at it right now and it looks great. Um, our video portion of this episode, uh, we have the nomination. We have the graphics brought to you by the Oscars themselves. We, we didn't ask them for it, but it's available on social media. And so we're using it for the sake of the purposes of this video. But uh, yeah, if you're watching us, we have the categories up on there so you guys can see at least what we're talking about. At least the, <laughs> we're putting a, 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 a picture to the name. Yeah. Um, so it, that we're not, we're not just seeing talking heads the whole time. We got production value here, guys. We this got is, some production. This is the value first here. time. So this, we'll, you know, we're going to, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see yes. what happens. Yes. But I'm, I'm enjoying this. Looks, this looks great. Uh, so yes. So moving on from animated shorts. So Ernesto picks an ostrich told me the world is fake and I believe it. And I'm going with my year of dicks Yes. Uh, as always. And, and also moving forward, we're going to be, um, we're talking spoilers about all the things that we've seen, so yeah. bear warning there. And the the winners of the Academy Awards will be announced March 12th, Sunday, March 12th on ABC. It's going to be airing live there at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, that's when we'll find out yeah. when the winners will be announced here. But anyway, moving on. So our next to, one. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> our next no, go one. Ahead, no, go ahead. Uh, yes. Nominees for a live action short film. We have an Irish goodbye. Ivalu. Le Pupil. Night Ride and The Red Suitcase. So I actually went to the theaters and I had the theater experience of seeing all five. Um, mm -hmm. I did. I had a horrible movie going <laughs> experience seeing these. Let me let me just start there. And I think maybe that's what you were going to tell me last time when we were kind of talking about it. Um, because mine was, it was not good. Like I had people who were just like outwardly talking, like having full blown conversations. It's like. First of all, you're watching this. So obviously you went to the movies to see this. So you have some sort of right. appreciation for film. Like when you're walking in there, that's what I understand. Like that's where uh -huh. I'm at. Like you're not a casual movie goer. You, you, we, Ernesto, you make a very, very valid point. When you're walking in, very clearly it says the 2023 <laughs> short film nominees. 
you have some some understanding that the Oscars, you are going there for the Oscars. You want to see the live action yes. shorts for the Oscars because there's nowhere else to see it online. So that's why you're here. You would, you, you're right. You would think that these people who are walking into the theater, they're not your casual viewer. Yes. You're there for a specific reason to see this. I did not pay for your director commentary. <laughs> 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 to watch this shit in peace. That's what I came for. <laughs> I digress. I really wish that they would have put Le Pupil and Night Ride at the end <laughs> so that yes, I could have yes. seen the first three and then dipped out. And then walk out. But I think yes. on purpose, they sandwiched them right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, damn it. It's like, I guess I'm. I just need to see. I just need to see three. I don't need to see five. I can leave. Yes. I, anyways. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm going to – I'm actually going to go – my top two is Red Suitcase and Irish Goodbye. I think both had hmm. really great stories. Um, there was a little bit more tension in the Red Suitcase story where – but it, it also kind of details like a deeper story about arranged marriages and – just think like uh, just kind of an, an insight into another culture and what their life is is but then on the flip side you get this really touching story about these two brothers grieving the loss of their mom and them kind of coming to terms with that and like like damn like <laughs> like the, the the and it's funny like two of the three that I were waiting on were the two of the best ones that I that I needed that yeah. I really wanted to see to mm-hmm. to be honest like it's 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 a toss up. It's it's very it's like very very close. I really like them both, but for completely different reasons. Um, I, I I can let you simmer on it while I kind of go over you can, some. You of can these go as well. you can go over them. Go ahead and go because okay. I and then uh, let me just say let you pill on the second watch. Didn't really like it. It was whatever. <laughs> like Evalu was like kind of depressing. <laughs> And I did with Evoli was very depressing. Very, depress- oh my very God. depressing without any without any context. Night Ride was kind of was funny, but it was whatever, especially compared to the other two. But go ahead. <laughs> it, so it's so I want to let's. So I agree with you. I think the top two is definitely an Irish goodbye and the red suitcase, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Like that, it, it's hard to argue those are the top two. But between the other three, for now, um, Le Papel. It was fine. It was fine. Uh, it was oh, it was way too long. Yes. It was like forty minutes. Yeah, I was like, "This is a movie. Way this is long. not a short. <laughs> this, is a, yeah. this is a movie." <laughs> yeah, this is the third act of a movie. That that's what we're watching right now. That's forty minutes. That's that's about as much. I, I it's like I think it overstayed its welcome after the first twenty minutes. Like I like I think it didn't start getting good until the last twenty minutes of it. And the first twenty, I was like, could have just gave us the last twenty minutes, and it would it would have been right. ten times better. I, I agree. I just didn't care for it. There were some creative elements that made it kind of a little fun, like the transitions that were in there. Uh, but overall, I, I I didn't quite get the point yeah. of it all. Like, I, I didn't get it. Like, it was like, you, like, you're telling this little girl that she's bad. So I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to go with my behavior. And, but then she's a hero among her peers. Like, I, I didn't – it didn't resonate with me at all. I, I didn't get that at all. Um, uh, Night Ride was, was – was a cute story. It was cute. Um, they they definitely took uh, a serious ish turn toward the end because like I was laughing at the beginning when she like yeah. takes she takes the the trolley car. But then I was reading like uh, other people reviewing it, and it was like that lady couldn't wait five minutes for the poor trolley man to go use the bathroom. And I was like, you're not wrong. You know, I didn't think about it, but that's true. Like. <laughs> Like, damn. Like, she wanted to leave right now, but, like, hey, I, we'll leave. I just got to go use the bathroom, yeah. you know? And then she's like, nah, I'm peace. I steal your trolley car. Like, it's hard to feel sympathy for that character <laughs> when she's in the wrong in the beginning. It's like, you're not wrong. I get and it. it's not I, even I, like, because she just had to wait. So it's, because she yeah. just wanted to sit down. But, damn, she took it from zero to 100. Because she could have just <laughs> opened the door, sat inside, and had him been mad at her. And he would have been fine. He would have been like, whatever. Because at least she didn't steal the thing, which is what she yes. ended up doing. <laughs> What she ended up doing, right. And so then at the end, like, it takes a turn where a trans character comes in and then uh, they started getting bullied by other people in the in the trolley. She tried to stand up for them, didn't work out, and then they ended up leaving. She followed them and said to the bullies, hey, uh, you drive it. I'm not driving this thing no more because they think that she is the, the driver of the trolley cart. And then he... <laughs> And then they said, okay, fine, I'll drive it. She walks out. She sits on the bench 
with them. And then the police is tracing the trolley car and that's the end of the story. So sure. Yeah, it was like, I, I guess, are we saying don't bully, but also, I mean, our main character was not in the right either. Yes. Like, yes, in the, in the right for, for standing up for the character, but also not in the right for stealing the trolley car in the first place. It's, I, I feel like a little mix there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Ivalu, right? Is that said that right? Yeah. Ivalu. 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 Yeah. That was just depressing. So depressing. That was just a depressing story. Did you did you catch the end? Like the last sentence that she said really hit home with me where I I think the people of the town is missing her sister because they think that she ran away and they don't know where she is. Where I think the sister and the raven are the only people that know that she is in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And she killed herself. Yeah, I kind of got. I gathered that. I gathered that okay. she had killed herself, and that the Raven knew, and that she was following like you know old places that they've been. And right, right. It was it was really dark. <laughs> it was just, yeah, I was like, my God. But it, but oh, it, God. see, but then, but, but was it because the father was too strict? Like, is that is is that what I gathered? Is like, was he too Whoa. overpowering, or like, I well, they they. They shut the door, so we don't know exactly what happened. We just know that there is some sort of violent act behind happening behind closed doors. Whether we go as far as rape, we don't know. But it's it's a very dark story. Whatever happened behind those doors led to her committing suicide. Damn, that's dark. <laughs> that's that is oof, dark. Shit. <laughs> that's very dark. Yeah. And yeah, but like it, it's ve- it's a very dark short story. Whereas. The other two, like the Red Suitcase, now going back to our two you know, more prominent ones, I, like the Red Suitcase has something to say about the society and how, you know, arranged marriages is, is not necessarily the best thing mm-hmm. um, at all. And we can see how a dark turn it can be. So like that, I feel like I had a kind of very similar to um, the one that won last year with Riz Ahmed. I forgot oh, that one. The Long Goodbye, yes. I would think it was yeah, called. Yeah. Um and um, that had something to say about the uh, – it, w- it was powerful as a short film as well as a message that was also sending out there. The Red Suitcase is doing something very similar. Also, it was tense as hell. I was on the edge of my seat with that one. Yeah, see, that's what – like, that's it. I really I, I really liked it for that reason. Like, it's it's yeah. very hard for me to pick between the two of them. So, wait, what is what is your pick? What's your pick? Between Irish, or I'm sorry, what, uh, is your t- what are you what are you going with? Oh, so last one, the Irish goodbye. I I love that one. I was smiling from ear to ear. It it had a lot of heart to it. Brotherly love, grieving. Um, I I I laughed. I you know I I didn't tear up, but I felt like I could have. Yeah. It was emotional. You know, and I think it had the total package of like a wide range of emotions, and I feel like a lot of people can resonate with that. So it's it's hard to decide but i'm gonna give the slight edge to a more happier story with an irish goodbye than i am with the red like, suitcase i would have loved to see an irish goodbye as a full-length film as a comedy mm, mm-hmm. as a comedy in place of banshees of inner yeah yes right? does it because they're both irish <laughs> yes. they're literally both irish yeah. and they're both like one is about friends and one is about brothers but i felt like yeah. This was a better story about like camaraderie and being together and grieve and just uh, uh, I mean we'll get to that when we get there but you know what I mean <laughs> yeah but 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 also I, I'm with you there because like I was even thinking about this and like this could be an hour and a half solid movie I watch it you know it's, I watch it yeah easily easily same same actors how are the same yeah. too. Just give us a longer version of it. And this isn't the first time that a short would turn into a feature length film. It can be done before. We can half the movie could be more about the relationship between the mother before she passes away. You know, and then we can, you know, it's it's easy, easy, easy 90 minute story. Um, and also an Irish goodbye has a slight edge because it also won the BAFTAs as well for, for live action short. So there's also a like there. It's also won another award um in the awards category. So yeah, I'm gonna give the slight edge to the Irish goodbye. I think it should and will win. I- I'm going to agree with you because I was already I was already kind of leaning towards the Irish goodbye. But I really, really, really liked yeah. I really loved the, the the red suitcase. So I guess I should say I liked mm-hmm. it because I loved the Irish goodbye more. Um, yeah. But they were both they were both. Re- those are probably the strongest live action shorts that I've seen since we started doing this. At least these. Oh, two. wow. Well, no, there was that the first year we did it. The one in the jail 
where like they put you in jail for in, even though you didn't commit the crime. Do you remember that one? Oh, that was last. Was that last, was that last no, year? Or two I think years? it was like two years ago. I don't remember. They all. It might have been. They're starting I don't to remember, blend together. Yeah. <laughs> they are, but that was a good one too. I do. I did like that one. That was good. I don't think it won though, but it, it was my, one of my favorites yeah. from last year. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why we do the could and should. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> what, what, what we'll probably win and what we think should win. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we're both agreeing. Irish goodbye. Should and will. Yeah. You ready? Okay. All right. Next one. Uh, best documentary short film. We have the Elephant Whisperers. Um, howl out. Howl out. Howl out. Howl out. Howl out. Howl out. There you go. Um, how do we measure a year? The Martha Mitchell. The Mar- The Martha Mitchell effect and Stranger at the Gate. So we've seen four out of the five that are offered. Um, how do we? How do you measure a year? Is not. Uh, was not available for us to watch, so we can only really go off of the the four. But uh, Ernesto, did you get a chance to watch that two minute? I did. News. Okay. I did. So I, I, I was happy to see see the the creator who I liked from last year, from that story that you didn't yeah. like. I did not know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually when I saw that I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> you knew I was gonna bring that up. <laughs> like that, I was like, back to back, really Oscars? About this this guy back to back. Domination. I, I hope you don't. I worry. am really damn that. <laughs> so much shade. I'm sorry. Um, but I am interested I to see that there's a, a therapist who's been a therapist from for so long, and he's this is his career now. He's he's became he was a therapist, and now he's a full time filmmaker. I think I'm mm-hmm. I'm really interested in that. I kind of hope maybe he sticks in a documentary realm. I don't know if he's what he's going to do, but I would have liked to have seen this one. This seem I bet yeah. I bet it would have been an evolution from what he did last year. I can almost guarantee sure, I, it. Almost, I mean, look, but look at the the time, like the freaking long game he played on this. He like, did play the long game on this. So what it is is that he he every year he takes a video of his daughter and he asks her, um, what did he ask her? What are you grateful? Is what are you grateful? For, or what do you most care about? What, what do you, you love? Or something? Yeah, it was like a series of questions that he sat his daughter down every birthday from the i forgot when he started to like year 18 or something like all through the adolescent yeah, years it's 30 minutes and it's a it's just a montage of all of them but they guess they really highlight when she turned 14 to show that when teenagers go through that depression it's like you don't see the changes in somebody when you live with them from day to day but if you just get a snippet of a year and then come back to a year you see that you obviously see the evolution of that person right and it was you know that was a key year because she was suffering from depression and she didn't want to do it and it's, and it's like a reminder that you know this thing these are things that teenage years are hard for all of us so once again mm-hmm. he's telling he's hitting on like a very key psychological story to us as human beings like last year was on bullying in school i mean everybody deals with that it, whether you're the aggressor or you're the one being aggressed like or you know mm-hmm. or you're or a bystander he kind of explode all explored all facets of that and and then again too it was more of like going interviewing these people and seeing what they remember about this event like he remembered yesterday but then you know some of them they remembered it some of them they didn't remember it at all like just how people look at different events and how they affect and how they affect how one event affects everybody differently. So, and and this is kind of like along that same path almost where he's exploring the mind and like life and our progression. So I've, I'm kind of sad that it's not available to us. Um, but elephant, I, I remember, I remember the this one was also a pain in the ass to find last year as well. The same creator. He doesn't, he doesn't like his stuff to be out there. I mean, Sure, I don't see why we're holding out, but you know, I digress on but that. That's, that but fact. that's a whole, but that's a whole other conversation for the Oscars. Like, I know. You want yes. us to care? Do you want us to care about yeah. this shit? Then maybe you should make it more available. I use this analogy when we had Sonic on last week. The NFL yeah, yeah. makes it known where you can find their games, where you can find their players. Like we need more sure. of that for film. Then more people, more of a modern, like casual viewer can come on and watch the Oscars. Like if they wanted to watch it, when you drop the nominations, we should get a list immediately of where to watch everything and that it should be available. Otherwise, why do we care about your program? 
Like, why would we care about your program if you're creating? Yeah, if you can't like watch Ma- it, yeah. Like Matthew, and you talk about props to me for this. You, you, <laughs> the master scavenger hunter. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you, you, you track literally. You fuck it every year. You track. You get them listed out. You literally track them all out. You know when they're all coming out. Like, you put in all that work. The Oscars. Mm-hmm. Look at this. Instead of all this fanfare that they pay for, yeah. <laughs> why not pay to do the research and have that information available? For everybody. And then it should be yeah. available with enough time. Like, they're kind of... It looks like they're slowly but surely releasing in different ways, but in different in, in different streaming services and are available online. But, like, if they had... A, yeah. If they wanted to charge money, they should charge a fee. Here, you pay this. Everything will be available to you that's not available in the theaters. Like, if you, there's some shit. If it's in the theaters, then you got to go watch it. That's, diff- that's totally understandable. Right. Yeah. Or if it's on a streaming service. But if there's something like this, like this is not available anywhere, like you should be able to pay them a fee and they, you go to their website. Like we shouldn't have had to search for the animated shorts and all that other stuff. Like they should have that stuff available for that information should be available to us when they drop the nominations. Yeah, I mean, to, but to, to that point, like they do have shorts TV as to how we were able to watch all the live action shorts. That was in the theaters. There is. That yeah, they they put that in the theater. I, during the pandemic, they used to give it available at home, so you can you, you spend like a small fee to rent it, and then you can have them all available to you to rent. I wish they did that sooner, and I wish they did that like continue to do that. I don't think we need to go to the theater to watch a five minute short film, uh, of, well at least five of them. I don't think that's necessary. But the the animated and live action short films were available to most theaters. I think the only place that did the documentary short films were the Enzian down the street here in Winter Park. And they only had one showing for because because the Marshall, the Martha Mitchell effect and the, the elephant whisperer were like well over 40 minutes. The whole thing ended up being three hours. And I don't blame them for not wanting to occupy the theater for three hours on on, on the documentary shorts. I, I get it. Um, but anyway, anyway digress your thoughts on the other four <laughs> so that's right if we were talking about the other ones so besides not yeah. <laughs> being able to watch that one which i would have really have i would have i think i would have enjoyed it um but out of the right. four that i did see i thought elephant whispers um it was fine um if you want me to be honest i actually watched it at one and a half speed because i like i just felt like it dra- <laughs> like i just felt like it was so long and it was in another yeah. language so i was like i'm gonna have to read subtitles anyway but I was mm-hmm. ironically, I was able to keep up the entire time because there's so much exposition, which I understand. Like yeah. they're showcasing these beautiful landscapes and and just their time with them. But if I can watch it at that speed, and this is supposed to be a short, then it's too long, and it's way too long. Yeah. That means that you could have told that story in at least half the time. That's it. At, at the, yeah. Your starting point should have been half, but it really probably should have been like a third or a fourth. But so to me, that one, it was fine. It was too long. It was touching. Haul out. I already told. I told you a couple weeks ago. I kind of thought it was boring, but you really liked it. I know you. I did I really like did. it. <laughs> uh, Martha. I actually liked the Mar- the the Martha Mitchell effect. I thought it was really interesting. Um, just something I was never I was never aware of. So I thought I, it was a cool story. It was a cool documentary. It was it was good learning for me. I was like, oh shit, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like I never even heard about this. But I think the one that I really enjoyed. The most impactful one um, was Stranger at the Gate, um, especially in this climate that we have where with all these bombings and shootings. It tells a story about this guy who, long story short, served overseas and he um, w- had PTSD when he came and when he came back, he uh, he was in this community and there was a mosque there and he would just get so mad when he saw them that he would want to kill them. Like that's that's what he wanted. He just didn't want them to be around. He didn't want them around at all. And it got to the point where he walked in the door and they greeted him. And then that's where the chain and it goes down the journey of of like mm-hmm. what that was like. And it was a, and this is a true story. And I was like that. Yeah. It, it's a it's crazy. Like to think that we could have been like that one instance that they caused that one act of kindness completely changed right. everybody in that building's life. Like everybody's alive because of that one interaction. And it's just the, yeah. the story and the evolution of that. And just, you know, even though somebody might be coming from a place of hate, maybe it's a place of misunderstanding. And it's like it's to me, it was almost like getting the other getting the other side. Like we always hear. Yeah. Obviously, we always hear about the devastation it causes to the community that they're affecting. But then now we're looking at somebody and what the possible causes were and what leads us to that and kind of like a way out of that. 
Like it literally carves yeah. a path, what it was like to be in it and how to get out. Yeah. And, and you really nail it on the head there. It's a small act of kindness that went a long yeah. way. Literally. It's like that small act of kindness saved lives. Yeah. Uh, and that's just powerful. Like that's just powerful just to see that story and have it put on, you know, in this documentary short. Yeah. There's no, there's no question that that's a very strong contender. Um, so I kind of agree with you on mostly, well, mostly all of them. Uh, the Martha Mitchell effect, I don't, it did nothing for me. It was like, that's a nice, interesting piece of history. That's nothing I couldn't have read in a book in a, in, about, you know, down our government. Like, I, I feel like that that was a, an interesting put together documentary that I didn't know about. I didn't know about this person. Um, but other than that, it didn't serve much for me of any I didn't care about, honestly. Um, the Elven Whispers, again, nice story put together. Did, it was also overly long. You had some great cinematography in there. Um, but again, didn't do much for me either as well. For me, it goes down to the final two we talked about, Stranger at the Gate and Haul Out. And I don't know, Ernesto, Haul Out was really great for me. Yeah, it was slow. And I was like, why are we following this man kind of just living in this cabin? I don't get it. Until, like, you see that he's here for, like, this walrus uh, migration that's happening. And and then all of a sudden, which was the, the, the biggest, like, holy shit moment, is when they do that pan out and you see all of the walruses taking over the entire beach. Because this is their only safe haven during the, you know, uh, climate change, you know, things that's happening around the world. And you see that and you're like... Wow, that's an image. That image right there says it all. I was shocked. And then you and this guy is basically document documenting the actions. He's like, I'm living in this hut. I'm not going to intervene. I'm just going to see how this is impacting the walrus migration and how they're dealing with it. A lot of people, they're so squished together. These walruses are just jumping off the, the cliff because there's nowhere else to go. They're just packed in there. I think they said like over 300 plus, maybe even the thousands. I don't really remember the exact number, but they all died for it from from having nowhere else to go. To me, it was very powerful. Like climate change is real. Like that, is, this is happening. So, in my opinion, I think this should win. Mm. But, but I think what will win is Stranger at the Gate for all the reasons you said. Well, obviously, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like that the Stranger at the Gate story hits closer to home. Hits closer to. Uh, everything that, you know, that's been happening around all these bombings that's been happening. It feels like just second nature at this point, it needs to stop. And this kind of showcase that a small act of kindness can go a long way. And, and, and also, like you said, like a misunderstanding, it's like only if this could happen to prevent, you know, deaths on all the other ones that have happened, um, in our country. So it, it's, it's hard not to argue and it's hard to like say anything other, like, it's it's hard to argue that any one of these have a stronger story than that one. Um, so that's why I'm leaning closer to Stranger at the Gate will win. But what impacted me the most was Hall Out. And I think that should win. But again, that's where. So I'm assuming Stranger at the Gate for you should and will. Yep. Lock in. Yeah. I'm going to lock it in. <laughs> Get in. Okay. You ready? All right. Dive into the next one. So we are looking at nominees for cinematography. And the nominees are. All Quiet on the Western Front, Bardo, False Chronicles, A Handful of Truths, Elvis, Empire of Light, and Tar. Um, so I, the only one I haven't seen on this, I actually did get a chance to watch um, Empire of Light, but I didn't get, oh, okay. but I didn't get to see Bardo. But you sent me these behind the scenes, and now I want to go watch Bardo. <laughs> Oh really? You do? Uh, I mean, I, but you know me. I'm I'm such a sucker for cinema, like just cool cinematography. Like that's kind of like yeah. my niche of like what I really, really enjoy and really love. So, but to me, it just seems like the 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 care for this for that film in particular, which is available on Netflix, um, like he put a lot of care into it. So I'm I'm very curious, but I think I'm still gonna go with All Quiet on the Western Front. I mean, the cinematography in that movie was just, I mean, it, it was phenomenal. It was just so well done. I think Elvis was a, was a, would probably be a close second for me just because, oh, interesting. just because of how they, just how, how some of the concert scenes were shot. Like, I mean, the movie doesn't have a lot of things for it, but one thing this probably got, <laughs> it's got Austin Butler 
and it's got some cool <laughs> cinematography. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, this, the movie doesn't have much going for it. Uh, but Empire, um, what I what I will say yeah, about Empire Light is that I really enjoyed. Like it was very, the cinematography was very like practical. Like it was like it, mm-hmm. like, it served every shot served a purpose almost. You know, like it just wasn't there just to be there. So I, I love the intentionality they have that they put behind it, and it, it made for a pretty uh, Olivia Coleman plays this. this this woman who's who's dealing with mental health issues and she meets this guy and they meet while they're working at this at the empire the, the empire theater i think i remember it's called yeah it's a theater it's a, it's a movie theater yeah. yep um and it's just through that time in the 80s and there's actually some hints of racism because the other opposing lead is um he's african american so it's so there's that there's a couple elements in, of that in there there's some mental health in this in there um the story was actually pretty interesting i'm kind of surprised to only see it for cinematography um at least and maybe not for the oscars but maybe some of the other awards like some yeah. of the other awards I, I could have seen it probably for those uh tar well tar the cinematography was fine especially you know with the some of the i just really didn't like that movie so i don't <laughs> i'm trying <laughs> yeah it, but it, it was it, but, the, cine- but the cinematography it, yeah. like when she's doing the conducting um some of the earlier ones were in there they're in that main theater i thought they were cool but i mean it was it was fine i i think there should have could have been some other ones that are on there like i would have loved to have seen maybe avatar for cinematography um sure there, there is a, there's yeah. definitely some other films that i think could have replaced tar in this category I, I will I would put in my hat for Top Gun Maverick for best cinematography. I agree. I mean, True. another come one. On, There's another man. one. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sorry, Empire of Light, but I so I also saw the movie. The movie was fine. Yeah. I right now right now it, it, it's like 45 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I can see why the critics weren't favorable for it. I wasn't that jazzed up about it either. Um, Olivia Coleman was, takes it to like a whole other level in that film. Olivia Coleman was in a different movie than everybody. Else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was the best thing about the she movie. She was. <laughs> um, she was. Uh, uh, the only scenes that I actually liked about it, and that's obviously because I resonated with it the most, is when we were in the projector room. Oh, I agree. Like you were okay, going to switch thing. I was right. like, oh, I didn't when know that. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool, yeah. Also, sucks for the projectionist to have to be there for the entire movie to do that. Um, but I, I, I really like those scenes. Those scenes were great. I, I just at the end of the movie, I just didn't buy that cinema is what could help her mental illness. Like, I don't think because I think that's what they tried to imply at the end of it, but they didn't really hit that home throughout the movie. We we were watching a completely different movie than what the ending I felt like implied. No, we needed a stronger story. It was kind of all over the place. Yeah. Like this guy cheated on his wife and then we saw I we assumed that she left him. I mean, right. I don't know. We don't know. We're just like, "Oh yeah, he left." Yeah. But nothing about whether his life left him or whether he's like in shit right now. Like mm-hmm. we we got we got all this scenes of like her jerking him off and her having sex with him on her desk, yep. like this whole that whole blowout scene that they have in the middle of the movie, but but then we hear nothing about the end of it, or I guess unless that just wasn't the point. It was just about what that was gonna do to her. It was kind of all over that part. That part was all over the place. It was it was fine. Yeah, the, the story was all over the place. I agree with you. I mean, also surprisingly, it's directed by Sam Mendes, who did uh, Skyfall and uh, Spectre, the James Bond films. Interesting. Great director. I don't. It's so like I'm surprised that this was the movie he went to more or less next, or at least like he did after doing the James Bond movies, but. You know, it was fine. I don't really see it for cinematography. I feel like Tar has a better standing. Again, I said this before, I'll say it again. I enjoyed the first 45 minutes to an hour of Tar for what it was I thought it was going to be. And then it went a complete left turn and then I didn't care for the movie at all after that. I felt like it was a two-hour movie that felt like two separate one-hour movies. Um, And the first really... I would say that even the first 30 minutes of it had great cinematography. But then after the other hour and a half, just kind of just like, okay, we did some cool stuff in the beginning. Now we're going to do something like the more practical stuff. Um, Elvis, sure. There were some cool, interesting shots in there. I feel like the more of the conversation goes to, even though I didn't see it, Bardo, 
at least from the behind the scenes stuff that I did see, um, I just didn't feel like I was going to enjoy the story at all. That's why. And also it was three hours long. I didn't really feel like I, I <laughs> was going to have the patience to sit there for three hours and watch a movie. And from what I gathered, a lot of people said it was like a collection of shorts put together. And I, I mean, mm-hmm. did, did, did you watch the ending explained video? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you well, saw it. Like, I'm not going to yeah, get it. Wanna, I was like, well, I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. But it, it's two hours and 40 minutes of short yeah, stories. Yeah, it's a long one. See, that that yeah. that does that sounds like, because it was like, well, I could watch Empire Light or I could watch Bardo. I was like, well, this one's shorter. I said, if I can get around to the other yeah. one, then I'll watch it. And it's, Yeah, I was in the, I, I said the exact same thing. I was like, here are my two options. And, but I, I saw how the movie plays out in Bardo from like that ending explained video. It was like six minutes long. It gave me an overview of what the movie was about. But yeah, it did look like a series of random shorts that didn't really make any sense. And that's why, again, the, the critics gave it 59% of Rotten Tomatoes. So obviously they weren't really favoring it either. There was a reason why we were seeing those randomness happening. They did kind of explain it toward the end of the movie, but it didn't sound like it made up for the two hours that they had to sit through of this randomness. But again, through in those behind the scenes, I can see the passion and care that, that the director put into, you know, and the cinematography is what, uh, what they put into the movie. So like, I can see it definitely getting the edge there, but I'm with you 100% Ernesto. It's all, all, all quiet on the Western front. That movie, it, it's hard to argue how great a lot of those scenes were, especially how they depicted war. Yeah. Um, so for me, it should and will right there. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. So we, okay. we ready for the next one? Yeah, moving on. Doing? What do we got? It's uh, visual effects. Okay, so for visual effects, we have All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar, The Way of Water, The Batman, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and Top Gun Maverick. Now, uh, all of these were basically blockbusters. Yeah. Obviously, All Quiet on the Western Front was... Not a not technically a blockbuster, but it was on Netflix and it was still a fantastic movie. Um, I I think all of them kind of deserve the visual effects nomination for all different reasons. Um, the Batman, I see it. I don't think it's going to get it. Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. I'm in the same boat. There's some good stuff in there, but not amazing. Uh, Top Gun: Maverick. I'm oh, sorry. All Quiet in the Western Front. I think I can kind of see for visual effects, but also. I feel like that they depicted war so well, the the visual effects where they were was hidden very well for me to actually pinpoint it exactly where it could be. For me, you're 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 on two separate ends of where I feel like my top two are is either Top Gun Maverick or Avatar The Way of Water. Top Gun Maverick wins on the fact that they use very little visual effects to create the practicality of all those scenes. So are you again, that's where I figured it was more on a cinematography level of should be the nomination, less of the visual effects level of it all. But at the end of the day, are you really going to argue that, av- that the winner doesn't go to Avatar in the way of doing. water? He's like, there is a clear yeah. front runner. I don't even know why you're burying the lead. <laughs> like the um, the underwater visual 3D visual effects were incredible. Like there's not even a word to mm-hmm. describe it. Like, but exactly what I said. I, well, I was kind of saying it leading up to the movie. I said, if he's going to wait this long, there has to be a. Right. Ha- he's going to give us something next level 3D, like he did with the first. He changed the game with 3D movies when he with the first Avatar, and he did the exact same thing with this one. The underwater 3D is like, it's incredible. Like it's if you look, it looks as clear as day. It's it's gorgeous. Like there's no, there's really no other way to put it. I mean, and obviously the entire ninety five percent of that movie is all visual effects. Everything they went through with the motion caption suits that they use for like video games, just so that he can get more detail out of that. I, I mean, Avatar: mm-hmm. The Way of Water is for at least for me, is the should and could should and would should and could win. I think what I think should win. Yeah, I mean, it's I, – I agree. I think it should and will. Uh, it's 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 a clear front runner yeah. here. It, it doesn't it – does, the other ones don't really have any competition. Uh, like I said, I can see the argument for Top Gun Maverick, but it's more of a cinematography thing and how they were able to make that happen was just – I mean, to me, that thing looks great. Like, I, I actually rewatched Everything Everywhere All at Once and Top Gun Maverick again 
because it's been a while since I've seen the movie and I want to watch them again because I really like those movies and for the sake of this episode to really get like a fresh perspective on some of these nominations. And I mean, it the film looks fantastic, Top Gun Maverick. But when when a man has spent 13 years of his life perfecting the visual effects of a movie that is 90 to 95 percent animated for the most part i mean you give the guy the the now you give the guy the award right and then, well there, there then that's the other convert then there, there's the other conversation of where if what percentage of your movie is is visual effects with using cgi characters where you have a movie Correct. like marcel the show with shoes on but it, or is that that's stop motion isn't it Yes, oh, it whatever. is. But 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 still the same thing though. You, like the majority of Marcel the show with shoes on, it feels like a live action movie with an animated character. Yeah, Cuz you have real people in it. <laughs> there are real people exactly. in that movie. It's not just stop motion. Right. And then then it, the argument goes for then Sonic is an animated movie. I like how that's our go-to cuz that's cuz that's, that's going to win the Oscar. It's Sonic. <laughs> so whenever we bring that up, that's our that's always our go-to <laughs> comparison. Our go-to. <laughs> Well, what's the other one? I feel like that's the most recent, like, animated character live action situation. I can't think of one right now. I'm sure there's plenty of them. Oh. Or, uh, uh, no, is, is, is Chipmunks? That's... Oh, um, Rescue Rangers. Rescue Rangers. Yeah. That was, that was, yeah. is that animated or live action? True. Technically both. I mean, <laughs> both. You get, it is you both. You have 2D and 3D characters. Like, oh, it's yeah. like, it's in but... that weird Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit, who framed Roger Rabbit is a clear, another example. Yeah. That's actually yeah. That's a great example. Is it animated? I mean, again, it's a live action world with animated characters. That's that's what it is, and that's what Marcel Lachelle is. Uh, but anyway, so we agree. The award goes to Avatar: The Way of Water for best visual. And effects. that Top Gun yes. should not be. I feel like visual. It shouldn't be in visual effects. It should be in cinematography. I agree. In cinematography. And that's where it belongs. And if it wasn't cinematography. And if it wasn't cinematography, I'll give that the win. A hundred percent because right? of everything that they did for those pilots and the fact that they were yeah. actually flying in the sky and how they were able to show us that. Like how can you – how how are you going to put this up against Avatar? You know Avatar is going to win. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're just setting up Top Gun for failure when, at that point. <laughs> and also like again, like you're telling me that Tar, Empire of Light, and Elvis is – is is better definitely not cinematography wise than top gun maverick no it's not like they built special cameras just for it to film in the cockpit yes. like i i digress on that is there it's not nominated it's not going to happen but i feel like that is a clear it should be there Get it together, but it's Oscars. <laughs> seriously <laughs> All right, what's what's the All next right, one? So the next one we got uh nominees for film editing. We have The Banshees of Inisherin, Elvis, <laughs> you like you like that, right? Everything yeah, everywhere good. all at once. Tar, Top, and Top Gun Maverick. So, Banshees of Inisherin. I don't know why it's there for film editing. Sure. <laughs> Elvis. Sure. Sure. Everything, everywhere, yep. all at once. I mean, without a question. Like, that, yeah. there's a one scene where they cut, it's like every frame is an entire different setup and place. Like, I can only imagine the, the, the amount of complex editing it took just to composite that one. Like that one sixty second part of the movie, like that one part of the yeah. movie should should get awarded for editing just for that one part of the movie. Um, top. There, there's also sorry. There's also one scene in there because I, I again I re rewatched it, but every hit, the background, like almost like the green screen that they were fighting against, was changing after every hit as well. So it wasn't like it was cutting. Like the the fight was going continuously, but the background was changing after every hit. I mean, that's not easy to do. Can you do. imagine? And that's like, oh my God. it's like, it's like, that's like it, two frames a second. It's like, okay, God, that's another hit. Gotta find another frame. <laughs> what background do they want? God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, drag this one over. Uh, tar. Sure. sure. <laughs> Top Gun. Yeah. I, I can see it. I can see it being nominated. I, I definitely see where it can be nominated, but to me, the clear. Uh, should and will win will probably be everything everywhere all at once, at least for me. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Banshees of Inner Sharon, Elvis, Tar, fine. Like, they, they did nothing different as far as editing wise. I, I don't, like, honestly, again, going back to what should probably be there is all quad in the Western Front should probably be in that. Like, the way you edit war, that's typically a clear front runner for editing because how you edit action. 
Um, none of that's in there. So we give it to the Banshees of Inner Sharing that's editing a basically your film. The same, maybe Elvis has a little bit of pizzazz to it and, and Tar again. Um, the, the real conversation here is with everything, everywhere, all at once for Top Gun Maverick, but you give, you, you should and will to everything, everywhere, all at once for all the reasons we already discussed. I, again, this feels like a front runner. No questions. This should win. And if it well, doesn't, I'll be very surprised. It is my favorite movie from last year. So yeah. I may, I'm going to have a biased opinion guys. So <laughs> just at least not, well, not for all of them, but it, for, well, we'll see. <laughs> well, Are you ready for also, the- like we, we can see like, the the Where evidence is there. Yeah, you can see the evidence in the in the film. You see how much work is putting into. You're telling me the level of editing somebody had to do for everything ever all at once compares to the Banshees of Inner Sharon? Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. No. They're not even they're not even in the same they should not be in the same category in with that aspect. Like, come on. Yeah. And, and the same go like like the only thing that's again worthy of putting it up there is Top Gun Maverick. That's that's your only fighting chance here. But again, it's gonna go to Everything, everywhere, all at once, because I feel like there was just a lot more editing, and it did it very, it did it better. So Agreed. yeah, should, should and will, right there. All right. Uh, so move. Moving on. Yeah, production design. Uh, we have all quiet on the rest, all quiet on the Western Front. Avatar: The Way of Water, Babylon, Elvis, and The Fablemans for best production design. Um, Ernesto, did you get a chance to see Babylon? I didn't. You did not. Okay. I did it's, not. It's another three-hour movie. Mm. But did I did I did end up seeing it. I was shocked of how much I really enjoyed this movie. I Whoa. Okay. Yeah. It was so Damien Chazelle, uh, the director of La La Land, uh, and Whiplash. Whiplash was a great movie. La La Land, same deal. I and it's funny because after I watched this movie, I'm like, why did they not favor this movie a lot more than I think it should? It's three hours. It's three hours of craziness, right? Mm. But this movie, it, it takes place in the 1920s. And it, and it also takes place, so like the first 30 minutes of it is like this wild, crazy party that they feel like they had in the 1920s. Which I feel like that was what the, the movie advertised, was this wild, crazy time in the 1940s. I think the advertisement of this movie and the trailers for this movie did not do this movie any favors because I don't think people understood what the movie was about. After that, which is only 30 minutes of the movie, it goes into the filmmaking process in the 1920s through the eyes of uh, a, a new actress getting into the fold, which is Margot Robbie, and a veteran actor who is like, this is, you know, I've been doing this forever. I'm an all-star of Brad Pitt. And I was like, wow this is this is a this is well put together and so then you have that it had a great scene a great series of of like a great part of the movie was about that filmmaking process and how crazy that can be and then it fast forwards a couple year late a couple years later at basically the turn of cinema when they intrude introduce sound to it so 1920s was a silent era 1930s was a sound era and they the, then you see how the filmmaking process had to change from craziness to like we don't have to worry about sound to title cards that's going into it to then you filming in the sound stage that the like, sound is controlled. You have to build these sets. You like they're they're in the 1920s according to this movie. They're filming like 20 different movies at the same like 100 degree weather in the back lots of like outdoors in the back lots of. Um, of Hollywood. And then you had to change that all to the sound stages in a controlled room. And he did an amazing job showcasing that the last, the last hour of the movie where yeah, I can see where people started losing it a little bit. Honestly, mm-hmm. they cut it two hours in. We will be having a different conversation about this movie. The fact that we extended our stay with an extra hour is when it kind of went a little bit ludicrous we kind of rain did it in a little bit in the last 20 minutes, but like there was a lot that was happening in the last hour. I was like, all right, okay, I get it now. It, we're back to the craziness of L, of Hollywood and LA. Um, mm. And and then we get to like the, 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 the magic of the movies kind of ordeal. Long story short, I'm very surprised that the Oscars didn't see this movie favorably considering they'd like Damien, Damien Chazelle for Whiplash and La La Land. I believe this is the only actually it was one of three nominations for Babylon. 
Um, I think this is one of Brad Pitt's better performances. I was really shocked by his how much I really enjoyed his performance. Um, and yeah, it's it was great. I I really enjoyed it. I think you should watch it when you get a chance. All right, Matthew. Yeah, you're asking me to watch an Irishman. <laughs> no, it's shorter than the Irishman by an hour. <laughs> That's right. Um, All right. But anyway. it, it's it, is it it's is it worth watch? It is worth so you're you're saying that it's worth the watch for this for these for the the things that it's up for it's nominated for. Uh, I I would say so. I th- I mean I mean not only that but just a movie in general. I think it's an enjoyable movie as the movie making process. I think like what Empire of Light was trying to be like look what cinema can like in the eighties, but like Babylon's like fuck the 80s let's go back to the 20s and show you how crazy la can be like i was again i was really blown away by like it like it got me for the two hours i was i was glued to that i was like damn that this is great um it did sorry it did what mank should have done yeah, Mank didn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the nominations. All, all Quiet in the Western Front, Avatar, The Way of Water, Elvis, Fablemans, and Babylon. Um, I can see product. I can see 100% why all of these are in here. Like, mm-hmm. it definitely set up its environment. Uh, less so for Elvis and the Fablemans. Um, I don't think it was as prominent as the other three, but... For all the reasons I said before, painting that picture of L.A. in the 1920s and 30s, I'm going to give the edge to Babylon on production design. Wow. Yeah. I, I believe you because, I, I mean, the trailers the trailers showcases that. And this is the one that I was like, this is one that it, it could, I could see it, it, it could get it for. Um, mm-hmm. So you're going with Babylon, huh? I think it should. And it probably – if there was any award – around here that i think it could win i think it's i think it's for production design well yeah so i'm gonna go with all quieter in the western front Mm -hmm. pending when i finish that when i because i will i will watch babylon before the especially now that it's one of your choices now i don't now i have to fucking watch it now i don't don't even have a choice (laughs) now i have to watch it um so i'm gonna give it to all quieter in the western front just for doing an amazing job just for what they were able to showcase during that period like getting it to be as authentic as they could. I mean, the uniforms, I mean, the whole opening scene is about yeah. uniforms like that kind of alluding to that and what that, and what that entailed. So, and the fact that they were able to nail that so well, um, for now, I'm going to give it to all quiet on the Western front. Yeah. And even with the other, like Elvis, it's, it's like, sure. I can see definitely like, I feel like the glitz and the glamor and all the pizzazz that Baz Luhrmann puts in his movies like kind of diminishes the production value or the production design that's in the movies. Like you're putting all this flair, but like how much did you really invest into setting the scene? It, it was distracting. It's hard to give it to Avatar The Way of Water because it's all digital. So yeah. <laughs> did you what, what production design did you do? Digitally, sure, it looks great, but you didn't, you didn't put anything together physically. At least very like, little that, of it. Put that green rock over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna um, be the hill that you're standing on. <laughs> and the Fablemans, you know, nineteen what, nineteen sixties or so, nineteen seventies. I could yeah. see, it. I could see it for that too. I could see it. I mean, but it, it, I could see it for the same reason that I would see Elvis, Babylon, and All Quiet on the Western Front. Sure. To me, they're they are they're there for the exact reason that they nailed the time period that they were trying to get. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but again, so you're you're going with All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm going with Babylon. Yeah. So moving on, we're going to nominees for costume design. Babylon, uh, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Elvis, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, and Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Um, I'm going to give it to Everything All at Once. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, just – I mean the cost the costume changes in that movie are ridiculous. Like mm-hmm. I'm like they and I think I just saw online that they just did a huge auction for all their um for all the costume pieces from that movie because there were so many because of so many different things in so many different places and so many different universes that they showed mm-hmm. us that I can only imagine what it took to create to to put all that together. Interesting. Um so I'm actually going to go with Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I think 
I think that the the costumes in that movie is great. What they did for you know all the different costumes for Namor, what all the different costumes they did for Wakanda. I think to me that's a real standout for the movie, and I feel like it's really the only one that Black Panther: Wakanda Forever has a real shot of actually winning. Mm. Um, for for all the reasons that I talked about Babylon just a minute ago, like you're just talking about outfits from the 1920s. Like nothing really stood out to me costume wise. Um, Elvis, we're we're in the same boat here. And Miss Harris goes to Paris. This is the only thing that's nominated for. Uh, Ernesto, I sent you that video that Focus Features actually puts out about some of the costume designs and how much detail they put into it. That actually has a decent shot of actually winning because you're replicating a, a very famous designer and putting it into your movie. I can totally see why it was nominated and maybe actually have a real shot of winning. But I think. I think everything everywhere all at once is the only one that I don't think it's going to get. I, I, I do agree with you that, but that you had crazy costumes, but I only feel like it was crazy costumes for one particular character, but not as a whole of a movie. Mm. And that's kind of where I give it less of the, the vote for, because of okay. like, yeah, you see like, cause everyone else is basically wearing the same costumes in their <sighs> own different universes. That didn't really stand out to me. Now, you know, I, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, it's funny because hair and makeup didn't go to all quiet in the Western Front. I'm sorry uh, for everything ever all at once, but I would have given it more of the edge there. But again, for the same reason how they did the makeup for the one character. So I'm only like all the craziness that with the costume was only affecting one character where I feel like some of the other um, nominees were affecting the, the whole movie as a whole. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to give it to Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I think it should win what might win is Elvis as well as maybe Miss Harris goes to Paris. There could be some sentimental reasons they give that movie the edge that the other ones didn't offer. So I'm, I'm going with Black Panther, but I feel like so, this... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving it to Black Panther, but honestly, this is the one that I am least confident in because I can see yeah. the argument for basically any one of these to win. Yeah, and plus costume design is not something that I'm very like passionate about. So sure. like, if it's good, it's not something that I – like I look for cinematography. I look for editing. Yeah. I look for different things. This is something that's like, oh, that's cool. But it's not like something that I really – I have an, I have a distinctive eye for, if that makes sure. any sense. Yeah, that makes I just sense. point out – I can just point out like like everything all at once. Like I like I, I can get that. I, um but I'm gonna. I'm still gonna go everything, everywhere, all at once. I think okay. I'm. I'm think I'm gonna lock it in. I'm probably gonna be wrong, but <laughs> that's okay. Locking it in. Um, okay. to, this is a throwaway category. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Kidding. So you're going <laughs> with everything, everywhere, all at once. I'm going with Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and we are moving on to, to makeup and hairstyling. That's, yes. And we are. That's uh, all quiet on the Western Front. The Batman, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Elvis, and the Whale. Uh, this one, I would actually like to see it go to the whale, just mm-hmm. because what they did. I mean, what they had to do for Brendan Fraser for that movie and how they how real they made it look. Um, I, I mean, I thought it was really, really well done. Like it seems like that's actually what he looked like. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna give it for me. I'm gonna give it to the whale. What I think will probably win. Maybe Black Panther. Interesting. So I'm actually with you, Ernesto. I feel like out of the the out of the nominees, I feel like this is the one that the Batman has the most has the biggest chance of actually winning. Because if you remember, Colin Farrell as the Penguin Ooh. looks amazing in that movie. But mm. it's the same argument for Brendan Fraser in The Whale. It's this. It's the same exact reason. Like you did such a good job of building up this character who doesn't look like himself at all. I mean, Colin Farrow didn't look anything like himself in that movie. He did not like he almost like is that him? Oh, is that him? Like oh. it, the transformation reminds me of Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder. Yes, yes, that was a great <laughs> transformation. Um, the other three: Elvis, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and All Quiet in the Western Front didn't didn't show me all that with with hair and makeup. I can, I can see it for Elvis for sure. And I, I don't really see it for all quiet in the Western front. Again, that either goes back to like, 
like uh product like, it looks seamless like yeah you're not noticing how good it actually is because it because it blends in with the story like right what's happening and I feel like that, again, leads into more the production design of it. That's why you gave it to All Quiet in the Western Front. Makes complete sense. Hairstyles and makeup, not so much. Um, mm. Wakanda Forever, again, I gave for this particular ca- category, I see it more of the costume designs, less about the hair and makeup. So mm. I there's agree with that. It, like, we're, 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 it's similar categories, but obviously different. So with that, I think I'm going to, I think what will win is the whale. Because of Brendan Fraser's transformation and how that was a pivotal role in the movie, mm. what I what I think should win was the transformation of Colin Farrell and the Batman as the Penguin. I'm actually going to agree with you, and and I also have the edge because I just love Batman. You just like, <laughs> <laughs> and I, anything anything I can do to support my boy, then I will. So, but I yeah, but I do agree. Right. But I do agree that the transformation that Colin Farrell did was is worth mentioning, and it is similar. Uh, quality as Brendan Fraser in the wheel. So to me, it's almost like it's a very close one, maybe with the whale giving it an edge. Yeah, I agree. But I think the, so I think we're in greens, the whale will win, but the Batman should win. Correct. Okay. All right. Moving on. Yes. Moving on to best sound. We have all quad in the Western front, Avatar, the way of water, the Batman, Elvis and Top Gun Maverick. Again, I feel like this is a very, I feel like this is a very difficult one to choose because for a whole bunch of different reasons, especially when it comes to action, sound is a pivotal point that kind of ties this movie together. You can I'm, – I'm, Elvis and the music is – you know I guess we can con- contribute that to sound, but it's really about the music in the film, less about the other sounds that are in it. Yeah. Um, all Quad in the Western Front, It's I feel like war films always get the edge over it because of all the sounds that they do for depicting war. Um, again, again, Top Gun Maverick, it's it's not a war, but it definitely has a lot of action set pieces that can go into it, especially all the flying around that's in these ships and the different sounds they have to do to emulate that. Um, but when you have the Batman, we're under a similar area. I feel like the Batman will serve better as best score instead of best sound, mm. um, even though it's not nominated for best score, but also what do you do in the Oscars? Michael Ciaccino did an amazing job with his score on the Batman. Yeah. Um, so, and then you have Avatar, which is basically creating everything in the movie. Uh, every sound that you hear, these unique sounds that are, because it's a brand new world, like I can see why it's in there because everything is brand new. You have to create what these characters and what these, what these environments sound like. It's instead of imitating what was once before, you are literally creating new sounds. So for me, it's either between Avatar, The Way of Water and All Quiet in the Western Front with the slight edge given to All Quiet in the Western Front. Mm, I'm going Avatar, The Way of Water or Top Gun Maverick. OK, what, what are the reasons there? <clears throat> Uh, I just, I mean, the act for kind of what you mentioned there, just everything that they created for Avatar and just how they seamlessly put everything together with Top Gun Maverick. But I think, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to give it to Avatar. You, you, you made a good case for Avatar. So I think I'm going to give it to Avatar. Okay. So you think should and will? Yeah. I, I, so I think, I think all quiet in the Western front will win, but I think what should win is Avatar. I'm 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 gonna reason. I'm gonna double down. I have faith. Double down on Avatar. I'm putting my faith in yeah. Avatar. James Cameron, <laughs> don't do me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to best original song. So original song is "Applause" from uh, Diane Warren, sang by "Hold My Hand" from Top Gun Maverick, uh, sung by Lady Gaga. "Lift Me Up" from Black Panther: Wakanda Forever by Thames, Rihanna, and Ryan Coogler, and Ludwig Gorenson. Oh, my God. Gorenson? Did Garrison. I... Garrison. Garrison. Yeah. Natu uh, Natu from RRR. Great movie. Hmm. Uh, this is a life from everything, everywhere, all at once. There's some good songs. There were some There were some bangers. They got, we got some bangers this year. There's, There's some pretty good ones. Some bangers. Um, it's kind of a, t- a toss-up between... Lift me up, damn! I really like "Hold My Hand" though. That's such a good song. Like I'm, I really like. It's between "Not to Not to Hold My Hand" and "Lift Me Up." I'm kind of bouncing between those three. 
and and I agree with you. I think these are the only three real contenders in this. Like, I'm sorry, applause for Tell Like a Woman. I've never heard of the movie before. I think there were probably better songs out there to choose from. Um, this is the lie from Everything Everywhere All at Once. I feel like it was under the hype of Everything Everywhere All at Once, and they probably gave it the nod. I didn't see it as like a great song. At least the other three have something to do with the impact of the movie, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, Lady Gaga got scoring credit for um, Top Gun Maverick, and I didn't see it at first, but when I rewatched Top Gun Maverick, a lot of the instrumentals from Hold My Hand is in the score itself. Mm. So like, okay, so I can definitely see it, and there was definitely a big part of the movie. Um, Lift Me Up with Rihanna, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, come on now. Like, that's, that's a beautiful song. Um, but honestly, and this is this is kind of like my, this is the one that is like I'm doing it out of my heart and less out of uh, um, any for any given reason. But not to not to from RRR so far one. That's a great song. That's a, it's a that's a banger. A that song is a banger. banger. I remember we were when that movie came out. We were we were woof. We were yeah, doing, we were not, 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 not. It's 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 a great song, um, but also this is the only nomination for RRR, and I really want because because of politics and reasons they couldn't nominate it for um, for international film because the uh, the India had already submitted or already decided on what their submission is for international film. They were wrong. They should have changed their mind. I don't even know what the nominate the the entry was for their for the country, but it should have been this one. And this is the only nomination for RRR, and I really want that movie to say Oscar winning film attached to it mm. because it deserves it. It deserves a lot more than it's being nominated for. So for that reason alone, not to not to. You know what? In solidarity with you, I will also pick not to not to. <laughs> Because, I mean, RR is a fucking great-ass movie. It's a great, long-ass movie. But it's long. Yeah, fantastic. And it's wild. And it's it's just so fun. It was a, it's such a great movie. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm here for and, it. And, and also, it's been winning in other awards as well. It's like the, it, there's a precedent behind it as well. So I think it does have an edge of, of will. It should and will. If I was going to give it a second runner-up, probably Rihanna. Lift me up for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. That will probably be like a close second. Uh, the the Academy just announced that she's going to be performing um, at the Oscars, so that's that's a good thing because mm -hmm. you know she's had a huge hit at the Super Bowl, so definitely drive up those numbers for the for the Oscars. Um, but yeah, so I think RRR not to not to should and will win. All right, all right. So best original score we have all Quad in the Western Front, Babylon, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and The Fablemans. And I believe the winner is not there at all. It's Top Gun Maverick, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the winner wasn't nominated. <laughs> no, it wasn't nominated. I, I rewatched that movie. Come on, the Academy. You put Top Gun Maverick in all these other categories. But where is the score? That score is so good. Yeah, I agree. I've listened to that score a thousand times. It is amazing. But for the sake of what is actually nominated. Um, I'm going to give the edge to Babylon wow. for the craziness of that score. It's like, it's very similar to whiplash and La La Land where it's a lot of trumpets, a lot of like, it's a, it's like a, a lot of great jazz that's in mm. the score. And it's like, it has a great beat to it. Um, the other ones, it, it just feels like it's very quiet. Um, everything everywhere all at once is a little bit crazier at times, but a lot of it is like background noise that I kind of put together. You could give the edge to John Williams and the Fablemans. He put a great little ballad together. Um, but I think Babylon did a lot of craziness in their score. And I like, I feel like each one is something different mm. that I can appreciate it more. So I'm going to give it to should and will. Ooh. So then I will go. So I, I'm going to go the Fablemans. Mm -hmm. Until I watch Babylon. Okay. So I'm gonna do well, what about the what about the Fablemans that you like? I just for I, I like I just love John Williams and it's the and then the other ones are like if I don't remember them then they probably weren't that great. Like yeah, that's like fair. I have to like out of those that's the one that rem that I remember was like oh yeah I really like that. 
like mm-hmm. all the other ones like i have to, i would have to go i'd have to go back and re re listen to them like but that's the one that calls out to my memory yeah and that's a good point because like i mean you can complement the score for if it doesn't really stand out then it definitely complemented the movie for the scene but also you want a score that stands out exactly. because it gives it gives the scene more purpose where i felt like top gun maverick did a great job of like showcasing <laughs> the music and the scene put together it gave it its moments to breathe um whereas the, with, kind of going with babylon i mean a lot of the movie was just like craziness happening and the trumpets are just so in your face <laughs> while all that's happening especially in the party scene you're like yeah okay I, I hear you i hear you music um and i think the critics choice awards gave it to uh babylon as well so there's like it is it has one other awards but yeah i mean Honestly, again, the Babylon is the only one that I kind of see that it's a, a clear front runner here. Um, but the Fablemans does have an edge. I mean, John Williams did put together a, a very quiet score that that's kind of you know that a uh, reminiscent of the story that it's being told. Yeah. You know, uh, of of youth, and adolescence, and like growing up, and like yeah, it, it definitely works for the movie. And I agree that um, Top Gun Maverick should be here. It should be that's here. Another score, or even, that's another score that stuck with me. That don't. Yeah. Ch- 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 <laughs> you get the the lady. Oof, it was good. Look. Yeah, it's like it's it's fantastic. Um, also, uh, Devotion had a great score. Yes. Um, as well, that was not mentioned here at all. Um, that another one that popped in my head, and there's also a lot of great scores that came out last year that. For some reason, it's not on this list. But all right, so I say Babylon should and will. You're saying the Fablemans? Yes, I'm going with the Fablemans. Okay. All right, let's dive into our next one. All right, so international films. We have All Quiet on the Western Front, Argentina, 1985, Close, which Matthew and I both saw this past week. Actually, Close and EO, we both saw this past week. And the only one we don't have access to, which is The Quiet Girl. And that's, I'm gonna, that's another soapbox moment where if you want me to care about this movie, then you need to have it fucking available. Like, have this shit widely available. Like, buy the rights to distribute the shit from the people who make the film so that we can care about the Oscars. Like, mm-hmm. ah, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm with you. Yeah. The Quiet Girl was the only one we didn't have access to, which is depressing. Because that's actually, out of all the ones, the the three that we did not have access to until later, um, you know, later down the line. Just based off the description, this one was actually, I was interested in watching Same. the most. Yeah. Um, but instead, let's give it its due. We did see Close and EO. In previous episodes, we did talk about, in length, All Quiet on the Western Front and Argentina 1985. Uh, but let's, we'll give some time here for Close and EO. So your thoughts on those two movies, Ernesto? So um, with Close, I, have, I, of course, did not watch the trailer. So I went, in, mm-hmm. I went in completely blind. So the whole first half of the film where you think it's just about these two boys and kind of exploring like being innocent and you know kind of like boy love with another with someone else like your very your first true friend and kind of mm-hmm. when you evolve into kind of preteens and what that can look like and how does that look like with your peers like i was i was like wow this is like this is i was in it i was like this is really intriguing and then about like an hour in, it takes an extremely dark turn. <laughs> like, yes, like, and I, I think agree. I was like, wow, because you get the main character where he kind of, because of what I just talked about before, like he starts pushing his friend away. So, but then his friend gets very sad, and then he, and then they never actually say it. They never ever say in the film that he killed himself. They never said it. Right. But it's heavily, heavily implied that that is what happened. And I just think that that was just, I mean, it was a really, it was a really dark, dark and heavy story. So with, with close, I feel like I've, it's, 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 it's kind of wrong for me to say this, but I've seen this movie before and it, it didn't resonate with me as well as I feel like I wanted to, mm. because like I got the story beats, the movie was slow in the beginning and yes, it did showcase these these two, these two young kids, these two young boys who have this, what appears to be this love of friendship that could blossom into something more. 
It was that like on the line they, where you're not really sure. You're not really sure. And the movie did a, either a good job showcasing that this is just adolescent love, whether that love is at a romantic level or if this is love in a innocent, childlike, we're very, very close friends like the like the the title suggests. They were really close. They probably grew up together and they respect each other and they love each other as friends. There's a possibility that that could have blossomed into a relationship going, you know, in, in their adult, in their teenage and adult years. But unfortunately, one of the kids and actually or both of them were getting bullied in a way for saying that you guys are boyfriends and our main lead didn't like that. So he purposefully associ- disassociated himself with the friendship and decided to hang out with a different crowd and taking up new hobbies and making new friends and decided to spend less time with him. And later, about halfway through the movie, it landed into the fact that the kid that he was shoving away ended up what assumed was committing suicide. Committing suicide because he lost a friend, committing a suicide because he felt like he lost a, you know, his, the person that he loved. Again, it, it's, it was a lot of up in the air. You draw your own conclusions of how you feel like that, that friendship slash potential relationship could have landed. And then the rest of the movie just turned into a kind of the grieving process of it all. Yeah. And, and that's when I felt like I, I lost the movie a little bit because that's where the rest of the movie went. And I didn't really, you just see him just a lot of longing shots, a lot of him just going about his day to day, not really any, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I need a resolution, but they didn't really go any further than that up until the end of the movie where we get this, this moment where um, he confronts the mother and was like, he he felt guilty for him dying because he felt like because he was shoving him away. And I mean, that could have been the case, but I don't feel like it's all there. That, I don't think that's the sole reason, but he obviously felt responsible for that. And then the movie kind of just ends after that, after the confrontation with his mother. And then, but then what is with her like telling him to get out? Like you really, yeah. do you really think that this little boy pushing your son away is the only reason why he did that to himself like are you really right. gonna put that on this little kid you as a parent had nothing to do with the upbringing and the care for this child like come on like i understand you're upset and maybe you know it very seemed it seemed like in the something that she did in the moment or maybe it was just that because he because she realized that he was somewhat responsible uh i don't know it was just it was a weird thing and then she just finds him and they hug and it's like all right. And then that was like the end. <laughs> and then the end of the movie. Yeah. I feel like the ending was very anticlimactic for the rest of the story. Yeah. So like, I feel like obviously the first half was much stronger than the second half of the film. Yeah. Um, I, and like, I, I can see the nomination. I think it was a strong performance by our main lead, yeah. especially as a child actor. I think he did that, the role very well of like, kind of showcasing that yeah we're really cool friends and and then kind of transitioning to i don't want to be you know i don't want to be with you anymore to like i want to be my own person to then grieving great job by by the young actor um but the rest of the movie just didn't do anything for me by the end of the day like i feel like it lost its message and i feel like maybe i would have cared a little bit more if we might have focused on our two young kids for a little bit longer before he committed suicide. I feel like I needed something a little bit more from that relationship before I can really buy into the real reason or one of the reasons why he decided to commit suicide. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent. And then, so then we go to the other film that we watched this week, which was EO. Matt, what (laughs) you already know where I'm going. Like, what was, what was that? What, what, what was that? Like, what, why is that not? Why is this movie nominated? What the fuck did I watch? <laughs> <sighs> so, right? Talk about a movie. So, I, 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 I skimmed through this movie. I did the I, same thing. <laughs> I was like, that, I can't watch this. This shit is yeah. unwatchable. Like, I can't. The, you know that 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 skip forward ten seconds. I was hitting that a lot. <laughs> It's like, all right, donkey, just travel along. <laughs> um, you know what? There were a lot of other movies out there that remember. Remember that movie, Decision to Leave, that was almost nominated, but for some reason it wasn't. Like we 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 watched it, almost convinced 
that it was going to be it the, the nominated for for an Oscar and then it wasn't and then you see that EO was up there and you're like what the fuck was that <laughs> and then after watching EO you're like what the actual fuck was that like what the actual fuck did I just watch <laughs> like uh, I, it was not I'm good. a little bit disapp- I was disappointed in the Oscars in nominating this film I'm sure that there is a, a reason of higher stature and art house filmmaking that you can give reason of why the esteemed Academy members felt that this film needed to be not nominated. But as a, as a, as a, as a watcher of all cinema, and this was a too niche for me yeah. for me to actually give a fuck about anything that was happening in that movie. Yeah, I tried, like, I tried so hard. Yeah. I tried so hard. I rewatched certain parts. I was like, maybe I'm missing something. Like, like maybe I'm just not getting it. Like, maybe I'm just you, too dumb. Maybe I'm too dumb to appreciate this movie. <laughs> you gave it more credit than I did because I'm like, I just want this to be over. I probably <laughs> turned an hour and a half movie into an hour <laughs> at, at best because I'm just there like, don't care, don't care. Oh, there's dialogue. Uh-huh. Okay. And we're traveling. We're traveling. And now the screen's red again. Okay. Don't know why. Don't care. Moving on. Does this donkey have feelings for the, the circus people? Don't know. Don't care. Moving on. Moving on, moving on. Why is he with this American guy? I don't know. Only reason I know is because yep. there, I saw that he was talking and there were no subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on, moving on. And then at the end of the day, did the donkey die? That's what I assumed. It was like being hurled as cattle and then you heard like the the noise at the end. It almost felt like a bullet in a way of like that 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 maybe inhumanely killed animals. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the end. I really no. don't remember. Honestly, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> and I don't care. Anyway, back to the the conversation at hand because we were talking about best uh, international film for. That's how we started this. We obviously but, know our two front runners for these. Yeah, our two front runners obviously all quiet in the Western Front and Argentina 1985. With for I think all of the edge goes to all quiet in the Western Front. Same for for two things because all it's the writing's on the wall here. It's nominated for best picture. It's nominated for a lot of other categories. It feels like it's now a shoe in that at least for a film wise, it's going to be dominating this category. It's a fucking great movie. Like it really, it's a great. Movie. It really, really is. Like it feels really well done. Um, but we can give Argentina 1985 its 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 flowers. It's also it's a great movie. Maybe like a, it's also a great movie. Um, I think it definitely painted a great picture of the court case that happened in that time for Argentina. Uh, it was a well done movie. I didn't like it as much as you did, Ernesto, but I can see why it's up there. Yeah. Uh, but for all the reasons we've already discussed, All Quad in the Western Front is just a well put together, a better movie. Um, and it, it definitely, it's almost, I'm like 100% going to take that award. It shouldn't will win. Yeah, same. Locking it in. Okay. Locking it in. All right, what's the next one? Best documentary feature. We have All That Breathes, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, Fire of Love, House Made of Splinters, and Naval- Lavani. Navalny. The only, um, the only one that was not accessible to us was all the beauty and the bloodshed. For some reason, I mean, well, not for some reason, but this is an HBO documentary that they, for some reason, decide to hold. For some, I don't know why. They, the, I remember when it got nominated, HBO on their Instagram page. Congratulations, it'll be on HBO Max soon. And now I found out that it will be on HBO Max on March nineteenth. Like we discussed earlier, the Oscars is March twelfth. <laughs> So, why? so I, I can't watch it to watch it for the Oscars if it comes out afterward. Yeah. But I, I did see that it will be on video on demand for you to rent and or buy on February 28th. So at the time of this recording, that's two days before. Mm-hmm. So technically they are making it available for you to watch before the Oscars. But I don't know why HBO is withholding it. Maybe they want to make a little extra money on it before they put it on their streaming service. So a little bit disappointed in HBO for that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so that's the only one that I didn't get to watch. Um, the other four we did have access to. And Ernesto, you talked about this movie already, but Navali is a clear right? winner. Here. Sh- it was an amazing documentary. As soon as I started, I was like, oh, I'll start this one. It's like, oh, wow, that's actually kind of good. And I was like, by 30 minutes in, I was like, ooh, yeah, shit, like, <laughs> what did Putin do? <laughs> I was hooked. I agree with you. I was like, eh, political documentary, sure, whatever. And then you're watching it and you're like, wait a minute, there's a story here. 
And what a, it was well put together. Absolutely. Just the way that they constructed it. I mean, the fact that they had the forethought to record an interview, like that sit that whole sit-down interview, bar interview, yeah. that, I mean, that was fucking great. Like, to have all that, because they knew, they almost knew without a doubt that when he came back to Russia, that he would yeah. be arrested. It's almost like he almost wants to go like the Nelson Mandela route. Like, let them right. lock him up, let them serve his time to showcase the how how the injustices that are happening here and why we need like he's willing it seems all came together to show that he's willing to be the martyr so that we can so that Russia can move on from Putin. Right. And also like honestly that at the end of the documentary when he said he got locked up for 20 years, I was like, "Fuck, man. That's rough." I was like, like all this work you did. Yeah. Um and and also like the 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 biggest like the best part of that documentary is when they're interviewing, not in, so not interviewing, but they, when they were getting the confession. <gasps> yeah, and you're Wild. like, and you're literally in there like, what? I was like, he said <laughs> what? Oh, he did. Oh, he told yeah. them what happened. <laughs> and, and he's like, underwear. Oh my god, it was wild. Yeah. To see that. So wild ass. Wild. Documentary. Wild ass documentary. Like it is Insane. the absolute clear front runner. Matt, I'm gonna tell you. I tried to watch a house made of splinters and I fell asleep twice. I tried really? I tried two different times. It seems very sad. It was the uh, about Ukraine. This it's almost like a halfway house for orphans, right? It is. Yeah, I, I couldn't. Same thing with all that breeze. It it was on did you get a chance to watch all that breeze? Did you enjoy yes, it? Yes, I I also uh, took advantage of that skip button <laughs> a lot in that. It just wasn't interesting. In the, and the problem is, is that it the wasn't. subject matter seems intriguing, but that the way that it was put together and constructed was just not interesting. Like it didn't, it didn't captivate. It just did not captivate me at all. It, in fact, very similar how I felt like Fire or Love. Whereas Navalny, I felt like I was watching a fucking spy thriller. That's what I. That's what. That, right. that is exactly yes. what that documentary felt like. I was like, am I watching a movie or a, like or a documentary? That oh, it was great. Great documentary. I felt like I felt like Fire Love was well put together. Like I think it was a well put together documentary. It told a beginning, middle, and end of this couple who were volcanoist. That was great. Volcanist. Doesn't measure up to no vol, okay, yeah, sorry. Um it doesn't measure up to the uh <laughs> to the to like the spy thriller that was Navali. No no way, shape, or form. But it was like Fire Love, I feel like that's a, a good second place uh runner up, so to speak. Yeah. House of Splinters. House of Splinters was, excuse me, very depressing. Yeah. Oh, like my it. God. I was like, I feel for every one of these kids. I don't know. Like, I, I like, it was a very hard watch. I didn't, I didn't fast forward through it, but it was, it was a lot of, like, you, you follow three different kids, and you saw the outcome of how they, you know, how they entered and how they exited this, this house made of splinters. And I was like, Woof, man, <laughs> these kids have it rough and that war outside is not helping and these these parents are awful people and these kids are just here trying to make it by this this these these you know the house is trying to do the best they can and don't know if they're going to give it to like a family member or the kids to a family member or to an orphanage. I was like I don't know how long I can take this. This is a lot of this is this is rough. It was really matter. hard to watch. It was really um, hard to watch. And then all that, and I think all that breathes. I think you made a good point uh, and a good case of like subject matter was there. You told it in the most boring way possible. I didn't like you didn't really focus on anything in particular. Am I? It's a documentary about what you're doing as an individual, and but now I'm also learning about your family. Or are you are you doing a documentary about the cause of what you're doing and like trying to save these birds when no one else is? Like I didn't get it, and also it ended very awkwardly. That didn't didn't end well in my opinion. So yeah, it like n- none of them compares to Navali. It's a should and will easy yeah. easy winner easy, in my book. Easy lock. I, and if the problem was, or I guess the my benefit was that I watched um, Navalny first. So I was like, the oh. bar the bar was already set. So every, I'm sorry. I actually watched Fire Love first. I, Fire Love I first. I watched Fire same. Love first, and then I watched Navalny. So everything after Navalny, I was was like, yeah. if it didn't even it's... compare within the first 10 minutes, like I had kind of already like like pushed it off almost. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're, not I, yeah, to... <laughs> <laughs> you're not Navalny. You're not Navalny. 
not you're not as good. <laughs> Move away. Um, but it's funny because uh, I watched Fire Fire of Love first because I watched it before the nominations came out because they came out with a short list and those Fire of Love was the only few ones that were like available to watch. But because you gave such high praise to Navali, I was like, I'm gonna watch this one next. And I was like, Hot dog! That was great. That was that was fantastic. Now I will say, now Navalny I think should win, but a house mm. of a house made of splinters, there has a slight edge only because it's about the Ukraine war and how That's and how valid and how big it is right now. So I could see it going to for that for that reason. But if it does win, that would be bullshit because Navalny should win. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on Navalny. It shouldn't will. Right. I think it's okay. It's. It's it's okay. okay. It's, it's it's good. It's good. It's really good. Like it, it doesn't compare. It really doesn't compare to the other ones. I'm sorry, but I I see what you're saying about a house made of splinter. It does have a good runner up. You know, it's a good runner up. It is a good runner up only because of the subject of how like where we just hit a year with the Ukraine war. Like how key that right. how how close to home that story is for us as Americans. So I, exactly, I'll, yeah. we'll see. So I know I know you're ready. I know you're really excited for the next one, Matt. I am. Uh, best animated feature. We have Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, Marcel the Show with shoes on, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, uh, The Sea Beast, and Turning Red. It, we talked about all of these movies in previous episodes. I mean, I think you already know what I'm going to say, Ernesto. <laughs> what should win, for me, it's a clear should win is Marcel the show with shoes on. Despite how we feel about it, it, is it actually animated or not? It's up for the nomination, so I'm going to take it as such. Um, it's it's a should win for, for me. But what's a clear winner, because it's literally been winning in every other award show, is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Yeah. That's It's a clear front runner. All the other movies are not even being thought about. It's going to win the Oscars, whether I like it or not. It's going to win the Oscar. So, I agree with you. I think it's going to win. See, your your should win is Marcel the Shell. I think my should win is Puss in Boots. Because I saw it. Whoa! Yeah, I, we saw it, and I was like, damn, this is a gr- It was just a really all... It reminded me of, like, the original Shrek. Like, of trying to yes. get that feeling back. Like, like with big Jack Horner and he's pulling all the Disney shit in his bag. Like I, it was, fu- yeah. it was hilarious. It was just a very well put together story. Like it, it had a message that it was trying to send to kids. Like, and it was, mm-hmm. and it was entertaining from start to finish. I thought the wolf yeah. that was chasing him, I thought that was a badass character that they added to the Puss in Boots. And then my son was like, he goes, I don't even remember the first one, but this one is like really, really good. I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I'm with you. This is great. It, it was a great animated film. Like, I was very pleasantly surprised. But I think for, you know, we talked about it in our review, all the care they put into Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, like everything yeah. that went into making that film gives it the edge to win. And plus, it's already been sweeping. So I'm, I'm with you it's on that one. It's been sweeping, yeah. Um, I, I'm actually uh, happy to hear that you, you saw Puss in Boots and you actually really liked it because I really liked it. And also, like, kind of what you mentioned before, it, it went back to – the roots of what made Shrek so memorable. You made fun of Disney. That's what made it so memorable. It was a huge spoof on it, and you did, and you kind of went back to that. And look how well that worked out for you yeah, for great. this movie as well. And also, the animation style was also great as well. Um, so I also love, like, yeah. specifically with that, like um, when they went to the fight scenes, the animation was very similar. It was like almost like a color splash, like what they did, yeah. like um, very similar to like uh, the bad guys. That came out last yes, year. Yeah. The animation only Absolutely. for the fight scenes. It, it it came to that point, but I, but I like the different the how it was different just because they just added variation for that added variation and added to the film. Yeah, but as like we said, Pinocchio. Like, I'll be surprised if Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio doesn't win. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio doesn't win. Yeah, because that has been sweeping. But and for all the right reasons, we saw the behind the scenes. They put a lot of man hours, a lot of work, a lot of care into developing the story. It's stop motion. It's different, um, a different take on Pinocchio. It has all the ingredients of winning the award, and and it has been. So it's a clear front runner. But you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be mad if Marcel or even Post and Boots takes it. I'll, I'll be, I'll be quite surprised, honestly. But it's Pinocchio. <laughs> it's gonna take. It's it's, it's no question there. Uh, what's the next one? So we are on adapted screenplay. So it's all acquired on the Western Front. Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery. Living. 
Top Gun Maverick, and Women Talking. So. Your thoughts? Hmm. I'm going to go with... Damn, this one... This one's a hard one. I wrote it down too, but because I wasn't sure. It, it, I, I think this one is a toss-up for me. Uh, I'm gonna go Top Gun or All Quiet on the Western Front. This one's wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like uh, it, for me it go down to two, and it's All Quiet on the Western Front or Women Talking. Mm. I. I feel like that it being adapted from, I believe it's a book. It did a really good job with the adaptation of that and having that story being told. I feel like that women talking, this is the only award that has a clear shot of maybe winning, but also this is, this it was a really good adaptation of all quiet in the Western front. So I'm going to give the edge to all quiet in the Western front. But I think, I think it's, sh- that should win. I know it, it, but but women women talking might take it. But I'm gonna go with the side edge over to all quiet on the Western Front. Uh, I'm gonna go. Actually, you make a good point. I'm gonna. I, I was already all quiet on the Western Front, but I think my runner up is women talking. I agree. Yeah, it's it, it it's 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 gonna be a hard category to kind of nail down yeah. because I haven't seen much, and especially without the Writers Guild Awards, like knowing what won there, um, and seeing what other awards have won, I feel like that. Like, uh, is it is Banshees? Yeah, that's the original. Never mind. Um, but yeah, I feel like you saw Living. though. Yeah, I did see Living, did, and it was a it was a good it story. For, do you see it for at I, least for the nomination? Um, yeah, I mean it was fine. I thought it was a good story. Um, nothing that stood out to me really. I mean, there was a moment in there where they did, you know, they kind of did like a flashback where I thought the movie was kind of ending. So that was clever, but that's nothing that Glass Onion didn't do. Mm. So, so like that, they're kind of on the same. I'm surprised that Top Gun Maverick is even like talk about a movie that seems a little odd for it to be under adapted screenplay. Um, again, let's take that and put it over the cinematography. I don't know why we're here for writing. The <laughs> writing wasn't the standout in my opinion. Um, but like women talking, the whole movie was about dialogue. The whole movie was about talking. And it, it like the movie predicated on two things, the performances and the script. Mm. Like, the rest of it acted like, you know, that you they were just sitting in a room for the majority of the movie. So I feel like, again, that's where it, I, it has a chance of winning. So maybe it probably will win. But I feel like All Quad in the Western Front, since it was adapted and it was adapted so well under a different sense of like it was just a really good adaptation. So I feel like it could also take the win there as well. So I think maybe All Quad in the Western Front should, but probably will win as women talking. Agreed. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. All right, so moving on yeah. to original screenplay. Original screenplay. We have The Banshees of Inner Sharon, uh, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Fablemans, Tar, and The Triangle of Sadness. Now, Ernesto, this is the first time we're mentioning The Triangle of Sadness. Did you end up seeing the movie? Yes, Matthew. I actually did get to watch it. So I think okay. I think that I liked it more than you did. Okay, fair enough. Um, I liked the first – right up until – like there was a lot that I liked, and then there was a lot that was just like, like way out of left field. Yeah, a crazy yep. scene that I actually really enjoyed was the whole dinner scene. Like, oh, really? Because like <laughs> it's a, it's such a funny take on like, like people who eat bougie food and they pretend like like oh yeah this is great and then you got Woody Harrelson's like burger and fries <laughs> he's like I'm not one for fancy food and they're like it's octopus and it's like jelly fat and they're like. Ooh. And they and it's funny. It's like they're chugging the champagne. It's like, oh, I wonder if they. I wonder if that's actually why they drink champagne, just to guzzle down some nasty shit that they actually don't yeah. like, but it's expensive. Um, so there were some themes that I really, really enjoyed, which which is the ones on class. They did a really, mm-hmm. was a, they did a really good take on class. Um, kind of the whole influencer thing, the male, the whole male feminist thing, and how that and how that bit him back in the end when they were in the island. Uh, kind of yeah. saying that, like, certain when the elites, people who I guess who they consider to be the elite rich in this world, like, in you know, a mirror of our world, that they that they pay for everything else to be done. So they, they don't right. have any actual life skills. Like, I loved that whole theme of when the, 
toilet the say the the lady who was in charge of cleaning the bathroom is a manager yeah when she came she goes and there i'm the bathroom manager on here i'm the captain i yeah thought that that was a baller ass line i was like damn that's a good ass line so there there is for every but i will say that it's way too long i felt like they could have yeah. done they probably could have tell a more effective story if they had trimmed like maybe like a maybe even i'll even go as far as say as maybe half you could have cut this movie. Wow. You could have cut this movie in half, maybe a little bit over half. So maybe like I could have seen this movie easily been an hour forty five, maybe two hours. Pushing it would have been two hours. Like the whole, yeah. the whole him Woody Harrelson and this guy rambling on the boat before they were taken by the Somali pirates. You didn't really need it. What was yeah. what was key and what was a clear a clear connection to the whole class and all that. Is the whole them throwing the grenade and, and then ironically throwing it to the people who were the creators of the grenade and like them talking about hard times with the landmines and shit. Like I like I gotta give it. Like the writing is there, but it's just I felt like they tried to do a lot of they tried to do a lot at once. Like we didn't even need the whole beginning of the two uh, Carl, I don't remember his name. Yeah, the girl's name was oh, Yaya. The, yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. intro of them being influencers. We could have gotten. You could have cut that down to like five minutes. Why did we need That's ten fair. minutes of, of exposition of him being a shirtless model, doing different looks? I feel like what? Like there are other ways you could have a much faster way you could have shown us that he was a model. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you 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 mentioned. I think you nailed on the head there. You said it earlier. But the movie where it excels at is the different themes throughout the movie. Yeah. I think the themes that they presented was was well done. And you kind of talking about it, yeah, it made me think about it. It's like, yeah, the themes were actually really good in the movie. And like I, like I kind of mentioned before, that there was a lot of I liked about the movie, but overall it felt a little, like a little bit random. But also it was overly long. Yeah. And I will say that my viewing experience was not the greatest because it was on a, it was on an airport. And sorry, it was an air, was, it was on an airplane. <laughs> And I was also in the last seat of that airplane, and I got to see everyone use the bathroom. <laughs> and it was, I was very, maybe I need to give that movie another watch because I didn't really give it its full due. Um, uh, see, and that's the other, see, but the thing is, is like where it excels, it's one of those that like you've already invested two and a half hours in yeah, this Yeah, I'm not going to do it again. I don't think you need to do, I don't think to get what you want to get to the more, you're not going to get more out of it by rewatching it. Yeah. Like if maybe if it was a lot shorter, sure. then. I, I felt like we would have to be be having a different conversation about this movie. Like at least it's it. There are a lot of parts where I was like, I was like visibly like out, like laughing out loud because it was crazy. Like that was, that yeah. dinner scene is fucking wild. Like just grabbing shit, and they're just throwing up, and they're just still serving this nasty shit to them. Yeah, it's like this jelly, and they're trying to push it onto the fork, and it's just going through. Oh, it was gross. It was great, like, though. <laughs> but there also, I think there's something to be said about the beginning. You were mentioning that maybe they could have cut the, the scenes of the influence a little bit down, but at the very beginning, when they were, like, trying to pay for dinner, I think that's something to that be was said. A good scene. That was a good scene, too, yeah. So, like, you had its moments, but I think you're, I think you're nailed on the head. If it was just, like, if it was in the two-hour range, I think it would have had a stronger story, and if it maybe focused on those elements... Instead of kind of doing a whole bunch of different things, it might have excelled a little bit more. But yeah. with with the re compared to the rest of the nominees, we have Tar, The Fablemans, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and The Banshees of Inner Sharon. How does that stack between the rest of the films? Well, uh, I'm gonna have to go with Everything. Every I mean, obviously, my I mean, the, my love goes for Everything Everywhere All at Once. I mean, it's such an original story. Mm -hmm. I mean. It, I mean, there's nothing that to me, as far as writing, there's nothing that really compares to this film. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100, percent 100 percent on everything, everywhere, all at once. I mean, she, could and should, could and will, could and will, it would, yeah, it probably will win. Uh, you know, because sure, because there's an argument for the Fablemans. You have Steven Spielberg telling a very personal story, but where close second, it's that, it's sure it could be a one. close second, but I feel like where he would shine more is less of how he wrote the film and what we later talk about is how he directed the film. I feel like that's where you give the edge to the Fablemans mm -hmm. on that front. Um, but as far as the script is concerned and how originality the script is, unfortunately, I can see the Academy going for the Banshees of Inner Sharon. Um, I don't agree with that. So I, oh. I feel like <laughs> what will win is unfortunately the Banshees of Inner Sharon, but what definitely should win is everything everywhere all at once for everything you just i mean that's so that story screams originality 
Absolutely. screams it. Because in it's in that the problem is is that is that we are as an audience, I feel like we are so starved for original content because like we live in a world with remakes yeah. and you know revivals and reboots that to see something so fresh and then to not only give us something fresh, but to touch on a theme that a major movie studio mm-hmm. is doing and to do for them to make a movie about the multiverse and for you to make a movie about the multiverse and for you to do it leaps and bounds better than Marvel is worth mentioning. Like there, yeah. there is something that needs to be said about them pretty much pimp slapping multiverse of madness <laughs> and show them like, bitch, this is what a multiverse movie looks like. <laughs> yeah. And also, what a strong story at the end of the day when it's really all about, like, generational differences and family and, you know, what it is to be good to your partner. It's like, like, all of that, like, even, oh, I wish I had a better life, but maybe, maybe take joy in the life you have now instead of looking at different multiverses and trying to find the best one for you. Absolutely. The story is so strong there. Yeah. Like, you can't help but to, to admire it. And I feel like it's way stronger than the other, the other things that that that's nominated. Like, it, the story's stronger here than the other the other nominees. Absolutely, one hundred percent. One hundred percent agree. All right, so moving yeah. on to oh, this one to you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, best supporting actress, a uh, best actress in a supporting role. We have Angela Bassett in Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. We have Hong Chu Chow Chow Chow. For the uh, for her performance in The Whale, Carrie Coden for her performance in The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Jamie Lee Curtis for her performance in Everything Everywhere All at Once, and Stephanie Shu who Shu yeah there we go uh, for her performance in Everything Everywhere All at Once. I think this is a very strong this is hard. category. This is a hard. One. This is a very. I think all of them deserve to be up there. Every single person deserves to be in that supporting category. Carrie Coden did a great job in The Banshees of Inner Sharon. Jamie Lee Curtis and Stephanie Shu nailed their supporting roles in that film. Yeah. Really strong uh, performances. Um, Hung Chow, she did fine in her, in her supporting role. She's good. Um, not as strong, not as strong as the other four, yeah. but for the sure fact that Angela Bassett has been sweeping in this category and all the other ones, it's going to go to her. She will definitely win it. And I think she should win it as well. Her performance in Black Panther Wakanda forever was fantastic. It was fan. I agree with you. I think she will win, but I would really like to see it go to Jamie Lee Curtis. I mean, mm. think of everything that she what specifically her character brought to that movie, like the way her and Michelle Yeoh played off each other, and like yeah. they, their dynamic together, and just how pivotal her character. And for me, it was a toss up between both characters from Everything Ever All at Once, because yeah. the daughter is equally as important like to me it's really hard yeah. to pick between the two because you get like the like the ex- jamie lee curtis is almost like the helping hand like the turning point for michelle yo's character in that film whereas yeah. stephanie shoes kind of represents the family aspect and and like the gender ex- kind of explores like the continuing generation and like why she even you know why she has kids like you know, to continue the the legacy on, to continue their their family legacy on, and I think both actresses did so well. Not that Angela Bassett didn't. I mean, she did right. amazing, and they had there's so much they had to work with with trying to incorporate Chadwick Boseman, it's like actual memorial. And I think I read somewhere online that what they filmed on scene, like that was the actual memorial that they on set did for him. Like that was their yeah. that was their real time. In real time, that was their their time that they that they mourned him was during that mm-hmm. scene. Um, so yes, I'm gonna. I think Angela Bassett will win, but I would like to see it go to Jamie Lee Curtis. You know what? I will agree with you on that. I think Jamie Lee Curtis did one hell of a performance, as well as with the sausage like hot dog fingers as well. She really owned it because she also, as much as anyone else. Like, you know, had to do multiple performances in that role as well. Um, I think she did a great job. Agreed. I think she has a little bit of over an edge over Stephanie uh, Shue. Agreed. And just a small edge. Just I'm a little sorry, bit. Like, not by, and it's not just by a little much. Bit. Yeah. It's not by right. much. And, it's, and, um, and I think mainly it's just because maybe she had more time in the movie. Like, I feel like, I feel sure. like she had more time, like more screen time than Stephanie mm-hmm. Shue. Also, I mean, for an older woman as herself... To, to star 
excuse me, in two pretty action heavy films this year, everything everywhere all at once definitely more demanding than her later film was Halloween Ends, yeah. which wasn't as demanding, but still so much physical. Yeah. Like she still got it. She's still up there. She's and an she's incredible still actress. Ass. And I and I think yeah. there's something to be said about that because she's like she's going back to a character which was like in the very beginning of the career, if not started her career at a half started to, her career, yeah. Like I'd have to I'm actually gonna look real quick. <laughs> no, I, no, I think you're right. That definitely started her career. And like for her to be in this point where like everything everywhere all at once, I would say is like peak Jamie Lee Curtis, like a very peak performance, mm -hmm. like very highlight of her career. Um, so I think it's, there's something to be said, like, wow, you're, you're at the peak, but then you're also like, you're, you have this, you have, you're, you're going back to the beginning almost, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree with that. Um, so yeah, but yeah, Angela Batcha has been sweeping. So for sure, she's going to be winning it. I feel like there's no question about that, but Jamie Lee Curtis does have, there is there is some conversation there that she could she could sweep it. I mean she she could take it, but um, I think Angela Bass is going to take it. Yeah. And uh, Jamie Lee Curtis should probably win it. I agree with you there. Uh, so moving on to the next one. So we have actor in a supporting role: Brendan Gleeson, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Brian Tyree Henry, Causeway, Judd Hirsch in The Fablemans. Barry Keoghan and the Banshees of Inisharan and Kihu Kwan and Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, I actually really enjoyed Barry Keoghan's performance. He he kind of played like the village idiot almost. Um, yeah. And I I think he fucking nailed that role. This this mm -hmm. one, but this one, you I think you already know where I'm going on this one. It's gonna be Kihu Kwan on Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yeah. Not only has he been sweeping as well, but he did. An amazing, amazing performance in everything, everywhere, all at once. And the story that he has of him, like what the story that he told the Golden Globes, like when he won that award, he said, like, I thought I was done as an actor, but the Daniels came to me and had this idea and they wanted me to bring me back. And what what one hell of a performance he put out there, not only like emotionally, but physically. Yeah. You're. Like you're just you're fighting up there like everybody else, and like you were just dusting this off, like it it was it was amazing, yeah. amazing. That that is a, a for me. There's nobody that compares to what he did in everything, everywhere, all at once for the rest of them. Now, uh, Barry Keoghan and Brendan Gleeson did great jobs in their in their uh, supporting roles. Like I think they did a great job in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian T. Henry or Tyree Henry. I did end up seeing Cosway. The movie was fine. Yeah. His I didn't really get much out of it. His performance, his performance, was good. yeah, it was good. It was good, but not great. I'm, I'm honestly surprised with the nomination. Who else would you have rather have seen there? I, I can't think of one right now. But, <laughs> like, yeah, I can't think of one right now. I, I'm not ask that question later. But, like, like even even Judd Hirsch. And uh, but you made a good point. His role was small, but he made a big act. act uh, he made a big impact in the film, The Fableman. Mm -hmm. But he who Kwan, no question, should and will, and and he definitely will. That's that that's a great story for the Oscars anyway. So that that it's it's short and sweet answer, but it, it that's what it is. Uh, a switch out for Brian Terry Henry. What about Miles Teller from Top Gun Maverick? Absolutely, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, even you know what? I'll even give it to Val Kilmer for what he did. True, because he he is retired from acting, and he's suffering from a disease. He didn't have to do that role at all. And the fact that he was able to get the mustard to even be in the movie, let alone say a few lines, that's worth it alone. True, true. I'll give it to that. Give it to that. So you ready to move on to actress in a leading yes. role? Yes. Uh, so best actress in a leading role. We have Kate Blanchett in Tar, Ana de Armas in Blonde, Andrea Riseborough in To Leslie, Michelle Williams in The Fablemans, and Michelle Yeoh for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, we've talked about Anna de Elmer's before in her character in Blonde. Um, it was a, it was a great performance by her. Uh, I think she definitely deserves a nomination, but I think that's as far as it's going to go. Um, Andrea Risenborough for Two Leslie came out of nowhere. The movie is available to rent, but I know she wasn't going to win. So I didn't even bother watching the movie. Sorry. Um, Michelle Williams had a great performance in The Fablemans. I think she was definitely the heart of that movie among other things. But honestly, 
unfortunately, it goes down to our top two, and we're we're getting a should and will situation over here. Um, which should win is Michelle Yeoh and everything everywhere all at once. Her performance in that movie was amazing. Yeah. What what probably will win, unfortunately, because she's been sweeping, is Kate Blanchett and Tar. But for the sake of this podcast, I'm going to double down and say this is, Oscars is going to surprise us and say Michelle Wynn will should and will win the award. Yeah, I'm also locking it in. Michelle Yeoh for the win. I will be very upset if Kate Blanchett wins this award. Like it'll be but it'll be upsetting. <laughs> she's unfortunately the front runner and you can go back and listen to our episode on Tar of how much we really didn't like the movie as much as the Academy has deemed it such and all the other raving positive reviews around it. Um, but that movie did nothing for me. And we've talked about that many times before. Yeah. Ernesto agrees with that. Um, her performance was fine. Yeah. I don't know I don't know why she's winning. So I'm hoping that I mean, at the end of the day, I hope this movie wins nothing. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of just like The Irishman. The Irishman was nominated for a whole bunch and ended up winning zero. Yeah. And I hope Tar ends up being an Irishman, and I hope that Michelle Yeoh gets her flowers yeah. because I'll be pretty upset if, if Kate Blanchett takes it. Tar is my Irishman. <laughs> tar is my Irishman. Or Tar is, is so. Tar, for me, Tar is the new Mank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's always got to be one. There's right? always got to be one, and that's going to be the last one. So that was... that's going to be it. Moving. Uh, so yeah. So so just to reiterate, Michelle Yeoh should and will, but there's also a good chance that Kate Blanchett will also win as well. Yeah, exactly. So we are moving on to actor in a leading role: Austin Butler, mm-hmm. Elvis, Colin Farrell, and the Banshees of Inisherin. Brendan Fraser <laughs> in the Whale. Like you like every time I, I just like saying the name. Uh, Brendan yeah, Fraser in The Whale, Paul Mescal in After Sun, Bill Nye in Living. So obviously I haven't seen I the only two I haven't seen were After Sun and Living. Um I am going to give it to Brendan Fraser. I think he should well deserved. Well deserved. I think this is a great comeback for him. And not only like if you yeah, if you want to compare to who he was in the mummy, look at the evolution of who he is as an actor. It is mm-hmm. it is what he did for that movie was incredible. I think he did a great job. Everything he brought to that role, um, I would love to see him win for this. So I did see Living. I thought Bill Nye did a, a good performance. I'm a little bit confused of why it's nominated up there, but, you know, here we are. Um, again, I didn't see After Sun. It, this is the only nomination for the film for lead performance for Paul uh, Mescal. Um, again, because I figured he wasn't going to win, I didn't feel any reason to watch it. It is available to rent if you wanted to watch it. Um, Colin Farrell did a great performance as well. I think Brandon Gleason is right up there for lead actor. I don't know why they put him in the supporting role because I think it's shared with, uh, Colin Farrell as a lead, Correct. but, um, another great performance by Colin Farrell. I actually, if we're going to give up flowers for Colin Farrell, um, he's not, I don't think he's going to win this, but it's, you know, give him for the penguin. He did a great job as a penguin earlier this year <laughs> or last year. Um, but it's really down to the two front runners. We have Austin Butler and Elvis and Brendan Fraser in the whale. And I also agree that emotionally Brendan Fraser brought it a lot more than Austin Butler did in Elvis. Uh, Austin Butler did one hell of a performance and he did a great impersonation and a great performance as Elvis and he is the the clear front runner of winning it. So I will say that Austin Butler will probably win because that like same thing with Remy Malik for his performance in Bohemian Rhapsody uh, as uh, what did he play? He played Queen. Uh, um, Freddie Mercury. Uh, Fred, thank you. He played Freddie Mercury. I thought that Christian Bale did a way better performance in Vice mm. for uh, for playing that character. Uh, was it was it Dick Cheney? Yeah. Yeah, he played Dick Cheney in Vice, and that was one hell of a performance. I think that definitely should, should have won over uh, Remy Malik and as Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody. So we could have a same situation again, where I feel like the better performance is Brendan Fraser in The Whale, and he probably should win. But the Oscar might be favorable to Austin Butler and Elvis, and that will probably will win. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be mad either way, but... I really, yeah. I really wanted to go to Brendan Fraser. I think he deserves. I think he deserves the award. Just a little bit over Austin yeah. Butler. Just because the like I, only because and I think what Brendan Fraser and how important his character is just to elevating that movie because mm-hmm. if he wasn't good then that movie would have been trash. 
Agreed. Whereas Austin Butler the... was the only thing that was good about that movie. Right. As as among the, you know, the glitz and the glamour and the pizzazz and the music and and also going against Tom Hanks, which was not a great performance. So, yeah, there was a lot helping Austin Butler up in this movie where you're right. It's all on Brendan Fraser. The movie works because of him and only him yeah. in the movie. It, it, like if it wasn't um, and, for him, it wouldn't like we wouldn't even be talking about this movie. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, you very much. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, so, yeah, should Brendan Fraser, will, maybe Austin Butler. Yeah. Moving on. I think you're excited to talk about this one. We're, we're, we're... Uh, this one's an interesting one. Top two. Uh, yes, the, the last two we have here. Best Directing, Martin McDonough for The Banshees of Inner Sharing. Uh, the Daniels for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Steven Spielberg for The Fablemans. Todd Field in Tar. And Ruben Ostland for Triangle of Sadness. I'm going to say it right now. We're going to be taking away uh, Todd Field and Tar and Ruben Austin and Triangle of Sadness. That is not even in the conversation right now. <laughs> we are primarily focusing on the other three, yeah. which the less lesser for Martin McDonough. I feel like, again, and I said this already, I feel like if he's going to win anything because he also wrote The Banshees of Inner Sharon, he will probably win it for writing, less of directing. So I'm going to kick him out as well. It's really down to the last two there. Mm-hmm. The Daniels. For everything, everywhere, all at once, which has been sweeping, uh, w- with the exception of the Golden Globes, that w- which gave it to Steven Spielberg for the Fablemans. All the other awards that has a better, better, best directing category, as well as the Directors Guild Award, went to the Daniels for everything, everywhere, all at once. So I feel like even with that alone, they have the slight edge of winning the Oscar, which will be a well-deserved win for them. Hundred percent. So I'm in the I'm in the same boat as you. Those are those are I mean, I don't even know why Tar is there. Triangle of Sadness, yeah. I can see it. The movie's too long, unfortunately, for me to care about the directing. That's that's the unfortunate part mm-hmm. of that. Banshees and a Sharon, sure, it was fine. Um yeah. <laughs> everything ever it's really up to these last two. Uh, I mean, the fable Steven Spielberg has it just because not not has it, but he's nominated. I mean, for bringing up for directing such a personal story to himself, and and Absolutely. bringing us and giving it yeah. to us so effectively, like what an like what a great story that he put together for us. But what the Daniels did is just so different. Like it's we have not yeah. seen anything like this ever. Like this is something completely original, and it's worked. It's it's a crazy ass story, but it works. And I think that it and works. I think that's Absolutely. where the edge is for me. So. I'm locking it in, doubling down on everything, everywhere, all at once. I it, it's it's hard for me to double down on it because I do agree with you. I want to be you, Ernesto, <laughs> but there is a slight part of me that the the academy is going to do what the academy is going to do, <laughs> and they're going to spread the wealth a little bit. And I know we've talked about this before, how much you disagree with that. That if if you should win, then you should win. We should not be spreading the wealth. Oh, it's a fucking but competition. It's not a it's I, not a it's not a participation trophy event. <laughs> <laughs> Which is I like I agree with you, but this is why I feel like that going back to original screenplay, they might give it to well, you, Martin McDonough. You're not going to get it for best picture, and you're not going to get it for best directing, but we'll give you an Oscar for best original screenplay because because of the writing. Steven Spielberg, you might not win best picture, um, you know, best picture for the Fablemans, but hey, we're going to give it to you for best director instead. So it's kind of like the same thing in a way. The Academy has known to be doing this in the past, and I feel like they might do it again. So what should win is definitely the Daniels and everything everywhere all at once. I 100% agree with you. But I can't ignore the fact of what they've done in the past. So what will win is Steven Spielberg and the Fablemans. Still a well-deserved win, but I don't think it it compares to what the Daniels did in everything everywhere all at once. And if Tar wins... I'm going to turn off the TV. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding, because I'm going to want to see who wins Best Picture. <laughs> yes. Uh, so there you go. The Daniels have, But also, the Daniels have a great shot of winning it, though. I mean, they've been sweeping all the other categories. So, And also, they took home the the um, they took home the, uh, the dark Director's Guild. So that's a huge plus on them. So well-deserved win if they can snag the Oscar. But I can't help but Steven Spielberg linger in the background being like, I'm still here, and the Oscars still love hey. me. So, <laughs> hey. All right, last one, the, the, big, the big one, one. the full meal. The as Ernesto full likes meal. To say. We are looking at nominees for best picture, and we have 
All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar, The Way of Water, The Banshees of Inishirin, Elvis, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, The Fablemans, Tar, Top Gun Maverick, Triangle of Sadness, and Women Talking. Matthew. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just let's let's start. Let, well, first and foremost, let's just start knocking shit off the board. So <laughs> let's yeah. go ahead and throw yeah. Tar off. Let's go ahead and yeah, Tar's, Tar's gone. gone. Triangle of Sadness is gone. That's Unfortunately, gone. I think you were right. I think where Women Talking shines is um, in the writing. So for me, for Best Picture, yeah. it's gone. Um, it's gone. Yep. The Fablemans, I'm going to leave there for a minute. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. It's obvious that one's a front runner. Elvis, That's a front Elvis runner. for me is gone. That's gone. I agree uh, with you. Banshees of Inishirin is gone just because it's not the best, it's not the full meal. So really, not the full so meal. really, my front runners are going to be All Quiet on the Western Front, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, uh, the Fab and the Fablemans. Did I get those? Yeah. So All Quiet on the Western yeah. Front, the Avatar. Old- Everything, everywhere, all at once, and Fablemans, and, and you know what? I'll even I'll even include Top Gun Maverick. Those are gonna be my top, but I think very obvious. My main choice is gonna be Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. So I, I will I will continue to chop off over here. I think where Avatar shines, it's over in visual effects. It, I don't think it will get any higher than that. So I'm gonna knock it off for Best Picture. Okay. Uh, top Top Gun Maverick. Honestly, it shines in cinematography. It does not nominate it for it for some reason. Um, but I think what it might get is uh, uh, maybe not editing either. Damn, what, what did we say it was going to get? It was probably sound. Sound. It, it might win sound. Yeah. Sound or Top Gun. Nope. It, oh, shit. It might, it might not walk away with anything, honestly. <laughs> but um, but I, I don't feel like Top Gun Maverick has the edge of actually winning Best Picture. So I'm going to knock it off, too. So... Really, the front runners for me are the Fablemans, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and All Quiet on the Western Front. If the Daniels win for Best Director, then I can see the Fablemans winning the for Best Picture. What? If really? Hold on, hold okay. on, hold okay. on, hold on. Okay. If the Daniels win for Best Cut again, this is the Oscars. What they do like to spread the wealth. If the Daniels win for for Best Directing, the Fablemans has a shot of winning Best Picture. If Steven Spielberg wins for Best Director. 100% the award's going to Everything Everywhere All at Once, without a doubt. A surprise win will be All Quiet on the Western Front. It has won Best Picture in the 1940s already. They could do it again. The Oscars like this particular film, and it's a great film. But I think the highest caliber might be in the international film section. So that's why I'm going to knock it off. It's really down to two movies. Everything, everywhere, all at once, and the Fablemans. And I 100% agree with you. What should and will is everything, everywhere, all at once. It is the full meal, 100%. I just don't know if the Academy has the balls to give it both best director and best picture. Mm. That's my only deciding factor there. Like, I think it it deserves both. It deserves both. I feel like they're going to give it to the Fablemans either in best picture or best directing. But... I, I, I don't see the Academy giving the Fablemans both either. So I feel like there's a better chance of everything, everywhere, all at once of getting both director and best picture. But there's also a good chance that the Fablemans could get either or. So I'm going to go with you. I'm, I'm committed to this. I'm going to double down on everything, everywhere, all at once, should and will winning best picture because it deserves I it. I agree. Matt, we, it, it deserves we did it. it. We went through the whole. We, we went through it. the whole list. That was a lot. Of, that was a lot of hard work we did. But you know, this is the most prepared that I've ever felt, and I don't feel. I think the only. Yeah. And I think the only thing that I want to watch, walking away from this, is going to be Babylon. That's Babylon. like how nice yeah. is it? Two weeks before the Oscars, I have one movie to watch, <laughs> as opposed to yeah. like, <laughs> it's like, oh man, I don't know how I'm gonna fit all this shit in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I kind of want to give us a round of applause for all the hard work we put in. It's got it's self gratitude at this point. Yeah. Um, I'm giving ourselves flowers because this is the most prepared that we've ever done. 
we've ever been for the Oscars. I feel like we are like I'm very excited to watch and see how it all unfold. I'm also like I feel like I just finished running a marathon. We're just trying to pick up pieces where we can find them. Now I feel like in a while, like at least the last two weeks, I'm like, all right, now I can watch my own yeah. shit. Let's where's we're the Last of Us. Yeah, new episode tonight. I'm ready for yeah. watch you right now. <laughs> Now we start That's catching up on shit that like, we really like the other shit that we want to yeah, watch. Really yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, this was, this was great. I think we had a lot of great conversations here. This, Hey everyone, this is our 2023 Oscars predictions who we think should and will win. I think, I think we have a pretty good lay of the land here, a good, pretty good perspective on who's coming out. And I feel like I want to be as bold as like, at least of what we said here today, we have at least 19 out of 23, right. From what we've said. I'd like, I'd like to think so. I'd like to say, obviously we'll find out on March 12th um, when it, yes. when it drops, but uh, also, Hey, you who's listening, what are your predictions? What have you seen? True. And what do you think? We, we want to know, write us, email us, Send an owl, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Send an owl. <laughs> Had to get a Harry Potter reference in there. There you go. Send Hagrid. Yeah. He, no, not Hagrid. Oh, Had, uh, gotta, Hedwig. Hedwig. Well, Sorry. Hagrid. Sorry. Hedwig. Hagrid's... Sorry, not Hedwig. Send Hedwig. The that's the owl. I went too you far. Did. I apologize. I did. <sighs> um, but anyway. That was our Oscars 23 predictions episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We really do appreciate it. We put a lot of hard work into this episode. We've been building it up for ourselves and to our listeners and now maybe our viewers um, as we go along this journey <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, through the Oscars. So we'll be, we'll be taking a break from the Oscars at least the next, the next week, Ernesto. I believe we are oh, – uh, We're going into the – we're in the we, world of Rocky. I believe our next episode – we are doing Creed three, sir. Yes, yes, we yes. are. Yes, we are. I believe if everything goes all right, that will be around the time. I think right before we'll probably record that episode right before the Oscars. So right after that episode, we'll be talking about the winners of the Oscars. But before that, Creed three. Man, am I ready to see that I movie? I'm ready for some Jonathan Majors and some Michael B. Jordan yep. to beat the shit out of each mm. other. I'm and I'm gonna and That's I'm gonna right. set myself up for the trilogy because Creed the first one is. I don't know if it's my favorite movie, but it's definitely up there, at least in the top five. Like I'd have to, I'd have to. There's a, been a lot new, more additions, so the list has been rearranged many times. But this Creed one with Michael B. Jordan is that's that's peak. That's a peak movie for me. It's so yeah. so good. Uh, I just loved it. the way it was put together. Ryan Coogler, such an amazing director. Um, but I'm really excited to see Ryan Coogler. I'm sorry, excuse me, Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan first feature film i think this is something that has been long coming i mean he is also an amazing actor and i love every everything he's been in i love and the same thing with jonathan majors these are two actors that even if the project is trash they are the shining star in that project hands down every movie they bring in and the fact that this is michael b jordan's directorial debut um, also holds a lot of weight to it as well. A lot is riding on like the anticipation for this movie. And that Ernesto, I've never seen the Rocky films, so I'm actually going to be doing a bigger binge. I'm watching all six Rockies, the two Creeds. I'm going full throttle into this because I feel like this is the only time that I feel like I'm actually going to want to watch all the Rocky films. And I feel like now is the best time I'm going to do it. Yep. So I'm going to I'm going to start that journey. And by next week, I'll be all rockied out. I'll be like, oh, my God, I've been through the rounds myself. <laughs> Feels like the Oscars. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we really do appreciate you guys listen, listening to us each and every week. Really do appreciate it. Definitely, like Ernesto said, we want to hear your Oscars predictions. Email us at boxofficebingers at gmail.com. You can also find us on our social media channels on Instagram at boxoffice underscore bingers, our Facebook and TikTok page at boxofficebingers, and our newly Twitter page at boxofficebinger without the S because no, we, if they, if they we allowed couldn't. another character, then the S would have been there. And, but it's yes. box office binger. <laughs> There you go. Uh, we appreciate everyone, you guys listening and maybe viewing us each and every week. Really do appreciate that. Come back next week for more movie fun. And for that, I've been your host, Matt Diaz. Ben Ernesto Santos. See ya.